Yajis notices that the kid looks like him, and after all, he is his grandfather. He calls in Harpagus, then he calls in the shepherd, he does a little investigation, figures the whole story out, and pretends he's not mad. Tells Harpagus he's often felt, I'm paraphrasing here from Herodotus, but, but tells Harpagus he's often felt bad about the whole thing afterwards, so he's, he's secretly relieved that the whole thing went the way it did. Why don't you go home, uh, tell your wife we're going to have a banquet to celebrate all this, and you can come over and, and, and we'll... we'll highlight you at the banquet, send your son over, your 13-year-old son, so he can keep the new boy, you know, my grandson company, and, uh, you know, we'll have a party tonight. And Herodotus says that Harpagus goes back home, and he's relieved because he knows he could have gotten in big trouble, and the wife is happy, and they go to this banquet, and this is where Alfred Hitchcock, Herodotus of Halicarnassus, takes the story over. And again, I keep telling myself, I don't think Herodotus is making this stuff up. Somebody told him this story. This is what somebody somewhere believed. Now listen to this and try to imagine a story like this from the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the ancient Mesopotamians. They just didn't write this way. Herodotus' story has the 13-year-old son of Harpagus going to the palace as requested and then picks up the story and says... This is from my uh, De Selincor translation, by the way. Quote, When Harpagus' son arrived at the palace, Astyages had him butchered, cut up into joints and cooked, roasting some, boiling the rest, and having the whole properly prepared for the table. Dinner time came and the guests assembled, with Harpagus among them. Dishes of mutton were placed in front of Astyages and of everyone else, except Harpagus. To Harpagus was served the flesh of his son, all of it except for the head, the hands, and feet, which had been put separately on a platter covered with a lid. When Harpagus thought he had eaten as much as he wanted, Astyages asked him if he'd enjoyed his dinner. He answered that he had enjoyed it very much indeed, whereupon those whose business it was to do so brought in the boy's head, hands, and feet in the covered dish, stood by Harpagus's chair, and told him to lift the lid and take what he fancied. Harpagus removed the cover and saw the fragments of his son's body. As he kept control of himself and did not lose his head at the dreadful sight, Astyages asked him if he knew what animal it was whose flesh he had just eaten. I know, my lord, was Harpagus's reply, and for my part may the king's will be done. He said no other word, but took up what remained of the flesh and went home, intending, I suppose, to bury all of it together, and that was how Harpagus was punished. End quote. If that had been an Assyrian record, it would have said something like, his son I divided, the pieces I fed to him. I mean, it would be a straightforward sort of thing. You wouldn't have anybody setting up the suspense of, you know, having him eat and not know what it is, and then having the platter brought in, having the king ask the question, do you know what you ate, did you like it, and then the platter's lifted up. I mean, those moments where you set up the tension and the drama, it's a movie. You could do that movie and change nothing. It's living color. What's more, Herodotus is clearly setting up these moments for his audience to do the equivalent of what we would do in a movie theater when some great scene on the screen happens that we're all really glad to see and you clap or something. He's got these moments because when you make Astyages out to be such a jerk, when he gets what's coming to him in the story, it's a crowd pleaser. And in this story, of course, he does. And while it's tempting to think that the entire thing is just a great tale, somebody's great tale, maybe not Herodotus's initially, there are definite facts mixed in. And you can see Herodotus trying to explain the reasons behind the facts. Today, maybe a screenwriter would call it dramatic license. Because Babylonian records indicate that there was a general who corresponds to this Harpagus guy. And that that general was involved in a battlefield betrayal, maybe you could say. In a key battle, Astyages had a large part of his army desert him on the battlefield and go to the other side. It very well may have been this Harpagus person who led them to do that. And Herodotus wants you to think that, see, he was a jerk, and now this is what he gets. And, and who would think that you could trust a man whose son you had served to him for dinner with the entire army in the first place? But nonetheless, 
The moment when Harpagus and the Medes cross over to Cyrus' side of the battlefield must have been a crowd-pleasing and satisfying moment for the audience, right? The jerk got what he deserved. In the Babylonian records, it's much more stark, as you might imagine. One of the texts from Babylon, as quoted by Pierre Briand, reads, quote, Astyages mobilized his army, and he marched against Cyrus, king of Anshan, to conquer. The army rebelled against Astyages, and he was taken prisoner. They handed him over to Cyrus. Cyrus marched towards Ecbatana, the royal city. End quote. By 550 BCE or thereabouts, Cyrus and the Persians were basically in control of the old Elamite territories and now had inherited control of the Median Empire, which was already one of the great empires in this particular world stage. It's kind of possible that the Lydian king, for example, that in three years Cyrus will be at war with, doesn't even really have a key idea who the Persians are. I'm not sure, but I mean, judging from the sources, this is quite the turnaround. And as I said, in 547, Cyrus and the new Persian Empire is fighting those same people the Medes were fighting when that eclipse, you know, caused everyone to think that maybe they shouldn't be fighting. And it's a great story because the guy who runs the uh, Lydian Empire now at this time is, is a guy named Croesus. And there's a saying about him you may have heard, rich as Croesus. And that's the stereotype of the Lydians at this time. Uh, as I said, they're known as people who invented metal coinage. Don't know if that's really true or not, but that's their reputation. And it's attached to them because they're, you know, thought to be extremely wealthy. And Croesus is supposed to have gone to one of the famous oracles, maybe the most famous oracle in the entire Greek world, the oracle at Delphi, which he may have been giving money to influence. There was a whole big problem during this period where some questioned. The... If you went to an advisor in Las Vegas who gave you betting advice and you said, will the Green Bay Packers win the Super Bowl? And the answer was, if the Green Bay Packers play in the Super Bowl, they will add to a great legacy. Do you bet? Croesus was told by the oracle at Delphi that if Croesus attacks the Persians, he will destroy a great empire. You could take that a number of different ways, couldn't you? You could say, hey, the Green Bay Packers are going to win. Or you could say, listen, if the Dallas Cowboys beat the Green Bay Packers, they have added to a great championship legacy too. It's just the Dallas Cowboys championship legacy. When Croesus and the Lydians fight Cyrus and the Persians, he loses. He destroys a great empire, the one that invented metal coinage. I would love to get into the kind of army that Cyrus had and what he used to accomplish this victory over the Lydians, but, you know, the Achaemenid military system is not well understood anyway, and it was only in the 1980s that they started putting together realistic reconstructions of the army in the days that are much better known than this period. I mean, during the Greek and Persian Wars or after against Alexander. In this period, it's all conjecture what the heck Cyrus was using. I mean, you can say, well, he probably used this, and it's logical to assume that, but nobody knows. When you read Herodotus, he's always got some little stratagem in play that keeps you from having to know, you know, really what the army was doing. In one of these big battles against Croesus, you know, the Persians were told will take their baggage camels and take the baggage off of them and put them in front of the army so that when the Lydian horses, who've never seen camels, ride up to the front, they'll be scared off by the camels. I mean, you know, you get a victory in a battle just with that. doesn't really help you know much about an army that must have been really, really good to do all these things Cyrus was doing with it. He does look like a very bold commander from the sources. I mean, one of the things Herodotus talks about is this, shall we call it a misunderstanding between Croesus and Cyrus after this big battle that starts off the campaign and it's bloody and inconclusive and winter's coming, so Croesus does what any ancient commander would have done during that period. He went home, went to the capital at Sardis, this giant fortified city, and dismissed his mercenaries and let most of the army go home and told his allies... You know, in four months, show up here and we'll deal with this emerging Persian threat. His allies, by the way, included, you know, the great powers Babylonia and Egypt. So maybe Cyrus was starting to be seen as the destabilizing force in that little 
geopolitical ecosystem in that part of the world. Nonetheless, Cyrus didn't disband the army. He didn't go home for winter. He, we're told, pursued the Lydians right on their heels. This is bold strategy. And he forced another battle. And we're told it was after Croesus had already basically sent most of the people home. The Persians win that battle. I think that's the camel battle. And then they face this monstrous fortification at Sardis, the capital of Lydia, that could easily hold out until all those allies show up in four months, you would think. We're told it holds out for like 14 days. And again, we have another Herodotus story about a, a back path to the citadel being found by a Persian who spies one of the guards' hats falling off, helmets falling off, and the guard retrieving it down some you know, path again. You wouldn't know about what amazing siege engines maybe Cyrus had because we always have some little story that accounts for how one of the great fortified cities in this part of the world gets taken in 14 days. Nonetheless, we also get some accounts now of, of, of something we've spoken about, about how the Persians may be like Darth Vader to the Greeks, but they have something, and, and you know, you don't know if you want to call this propaganda or a sincere and clever and common sense and realistic approach to things. You could sort of take either way, but shall we call it the tolerance bomb? We're told, Diodorus Siculus especially, mentions that Cyrus gave a deal to the Lydians before this whole thing started. He said, listen, submit to me, and I'll leave you in charge of this whole area. It's basically the same deal Xerxes offered the Spartans at Thermopylae. Come on, let's make a deal. Put down those weapons, and not only will you get to go home, I'll put you in charge of all these people. You'll benefit. Submit and profit, maybe you could call this combination of sort of Machiavellian thinking with a sort of Gandhi-like ethic, that's going too far, but I love the benefit. connection. A realistic, hard-headed, knife-in-the-back sort of diplomacy with tolerance and mercy and leniency as your weapon. I'm going to knife you with leniency. And, you know, you would have to suggest, perhaps, that there were two ways this lenient idea could go either not work at all, and then you see why the Assyrians had to be as harsh as they were, or because the Assyrians were as harsh as they were and the Babylonians who followed after them, the area was ripe for somebody who would offer... I mean, if everybody was going to be under somebody's control, wouldn't you want to go with the tolerant guy? And remember, we are grading on a curve here when we talk about tolerance. The Persians could be every bit as atrocious as any other ancient people on occasion, it just seemed like once they took over, there were a lot fewer of those occasions. Maybe the historians or some of them that I grew up with would say something like, well, that's because the Assyrians already broke all the troublesome people to the yoke of empire. Seems a bit far-fetched. Certainly you can say, though, that the whole sort of mood and attitude was altered, and you don't get any more of those really intimidating reliefs showing things like, you know, heads of your enemies staring up at you, or horrible violence, or the flaying of live captives, and you don't get the, the writings where there's a, a, a boasting and a propaganda value where you're saying, this is what will happen to you if you rebel against us. Risa Sargami quotes the Rassam Cylinder, it's called, and it's Ashurbanipal, the last great king of Assyria, boasting of what he did to Babylon after his brother, who he put on the throne of Babylon, rebelled against him in 649 BCE. First, he besieged the people until they were cannibalistic, and then picks up the narrative saying, quote, Out of hunger, the flesh of their sons and daughters they ate. Afterwards, I ripped out the tongue of those officers whose mouths had blasphemed against Asher, my master, and then slaughtered them. Any soldiers found still alive were flogged in front of the winged bulls built by Sennacherib, my grandfather. I whipped them on Sennacherib's tomb, and then tossed their quivering flesh for the jackals, the birds, and the fish to eat. In this way, I placated the wrath of the gods who had become incensed by their ignominious deeds. And then Sargami picks up the narrative saying, quote, This grisly passage related to events that transpired in Babylon precedes a brief description of the restorative work that Ashurbanipal undertook in that city, that the Assyrian king was unabashed about intertwining the account of his brutality with that of his clemency 
indicates that Mesopotamian royalty did not frown upon the infliction of vicious reprisals against conquered populations. This attitude enabled the Assyrian and Babylonian kings to base their policies largely on terror. During the two centuries preceding Cyrus's rise to power, the Assyrians and Babylonians had sacked nearly every major Near Eastern capital, and their preferred practices of population deportation and kidnapping sacred images had deeply traumatized the people of the ancient Near East. End quote. In other words, if you had ever wanted to find a winning military strategy, this might be the time where mercy, tolerance, and being the cool conquerors really worked in your favor. Cyrus is the one who initiates this idea that we're not going to impale everybody and we're not going to flay them and we're not going to force them to convert to our religion. You join us, pay your taxes, I may have some representatives in a garrison in your city, but life will be good. This Persian deal was very seductive. Now, here's where the story begins to dovetail with what we've already talked about earlier. The peoples that we spoke about, these Greeks who were in Anatolia, some of them spoke a language that was called Ionian, so they're often called Ionians, but there were other types of Greeks there too. Asiatic Greeks is a term that's sometimes used. These people had been paying tribute to Croesus and the Lydians, and Cyrus had gone to them before the war with Croesus and the Lydians and said, listen, how about you revolt against Croesus? And they said no and some of them fought on Croesus' side. So after Cyrus wins, all the people in the region are coming to him to kind of say, hey boss, uh, I always wanted you to win. I'm glad, I'm glad you're victorious. And uh, in the case of these Greeks, they went to him and said, can we have the same deal we had with the Lydians? And Cyrus gets mad at them, we're told. He basically says, you could have had that deal if you joined me and didn't fight against me. Now you want a special deal over all the other people in this region who didn't fight against me? And got mad. And those Greeks went back home, had a big meeting amongst each other, started rebuilding the walls of their cities, which they had knocked down at, you know, as part of their deal with Croesus, um, and put the word out for help. And they sent word to the Spartans. Now, the Spartans had also promised help to Croesus when he was in trouble. Supposedly, they were just getting in the boats, getting ready to go help when in 14 days the Lydian capital falls, didn't give him enough time to get there. Now they get, you know, in a very short period of time, a second call for help, and this time from Greeks. It's about the Persians, just like that last call. These Persians must be a troublesome people. The Spartans were a little busy when the message came, but they sent an emissary to talk to this Persian. Now, every historian I'm reading is assuming that these Persians and these Spartans do not know each other, that this may be the first time they ever encounter one another. It seems illogical considering all the trading and whatnot going on, but let's understand, best case scenario, it's unusual and these people don't really know each other. And a Spartan diplomat shows up in front of Cyrus, we're told, and we have one of these wonderful periods. We can imagine our Clint Eastwood type figure showing up in front of this king on the rise. Again, I try to imagine an Alexander the Great like, like figure on the rise. Must have been a pretty good looking guy because we're told that the Persian standards of beauty were modeled on him ever afterwards. This is the way Herodotus from my uh, Purvis translation describes the diplomat talking to the king of the Persians who's just conquered Lydia and who's just about to put the hammer down on the Greeks of Asia. Herodotus says, quote, And when they arrived at Phakia, they sent the most distinguished man with them, named Lacrines, to Sardis, to declare to Cyrus, in the name of the Lacedaemonians, that he must not inflict reckless damage on any of the Greek territory, since the Lacedaemonians would not tolerate it. Remember, Lacedaemonian is another name for Spartans. Now, this people that Cyrus has never heard of has just told him not to mess with any of these people he just conquered. And he basically turns to the Greek advisor next to him and says, Who are these people and how many of them are there? Herodotus says, quote, 
They say that when the herald had delivered this message, Cyrus questioned the Greeks who were with him, asking them, who were these Lacedaemonians who would send such a command to him, and how many of them were there? When he heard their response, Herodotus says, he said to the Spartan herald, quote, I have never yet feared any men who have a place in the center of the city set aside for meeting together, swearing false oaths and cheating one another. And if I live long enough, Lacedaemonians will have troubles of their own about which to converse, rather than those of the Ionians. Herodotus then says, quote, Cyrus thus insulted the Greeks because of their custom of setting up agoras, which are marketplaces, in their cities for the purpose of buying and selling, which is unknown among the Persians, who do not use markets and indeed have no such place as an agora in any of their cities. End quote. This is worth a little digression for a second, just from an interest standpoint. First of all, Herodotus would have probably known what Persian cities were like. He himself was an Ionian Greek or lived in an Ionian Greek city. He would have known this. And that's fascinating when you consider that you think of the Middle East now and you think of the bazaars and the marketplaces and all that. But the Persians had this really interesting cultural carrot and stick thing going themselves. You know, we've talked about this human laboratory experiment a few times in this program, like the Spartans, for example. The Persians had a different one going, and it's fascinating to me. Everything you read about them says that, you know, of, of the top three things that that society places import on, one of them is the truth. And the funny thing is, is in our world today, we think, oh yeah, sure, everybody should tell the truth. But what if you made this like a commandment that people took ultra seriously? We told you earlier that when the Spartan told Xerxes about the Persians, he said, if I'm lying, you know, treat me like a liar. And, and I told you that that's a death penalty. The Persians took lying really seriously. We're told that the education of Persian male youth was to learn to ride, to learn to shoot the bow, and to learn not to lie to tell the truth. Isn't it fascinating to imagine a society where this was both a state and legal requirement, perhaps, and certainly a heavily, you know, encouraged and incentivized cultural norm, thou shalt not lie? It almost becomes like the plot to one of those movies, you know, where the main character drinks some potion and all of a sudden, you know, is forced to tell the truth all the time. What if you had a society like that? What, what Cyrus is saying to the Spartans is, I can't respect any people who have these places in their cities set up where people can specifically go to lie to one another. And by the way, without going too deeply into it, there's a lot of connection to Persian religious beliefs during this time period and how that plays into the question of lying. The Persians were worshippers of Ahura Mazda was a god's name, and, and the old Medes used to worship a god named Mithra, and there's connections between good and evil that some religious experts tie to Christianity and ancient Judaism, and, and who the heck knows? All you know is that it's not just a cultural and legal question, it's a religious one too. It's interesting to speculate how much people still lied in a society with that many things favoring the truth. It's interesting to think about. Another human laboratory experiment, if you will, the truthful society, and how realistic is that? Nonetheless, we have now set the stage for problems between the Greeks and the Persians from this point on. If you want to call it a clash of civilizations, you who have marketplaces and lie and we who don't, it's about to happen. Lucky for the Spartans, they'll get to stay out of it for a while, because Cyrus isn't done conquering yet, not by a long shot. Historians still discuss whether or not Cyrus should be seen as an intentional, you know, a conscious conqueror, a la Alexander the Great or Napoleon, you know, somebody who sat down and said, I'm going to recreate the old Assyrian Empire, or somebody that got involved in a bunch of conflicts, each for their own reason, and, you know, when you win, you take over their territory and, and kind of tripped into empire. I mean, obviously, that's a little simplistic, but... Um, I think it's indicative of how in, in certain really key motivational areas, this guy is still a bit of a mystery. He will disappear behind the veil of our historical site, I guess you could say, for several years after his um, taking over of Lydia. He will leave a general, who may be this historical Harpagus guy, and an army behind in western Turkey, what's now modern day western Turkey, 
to reduce these Asiatic Greek cities, and he will go, it's assumed, to the eastern part of his realm and the northern part of his realm and conquer further and also shore up his defenses against the many powerful tribes that sort of ring his territory. Probably a combination of fighting some of them, showing the flag to some of them, uh, intermarrying and making diplomatic agreements with some of them, accepting vassalage from others. I mean, it was years of work. So this guy is doing the, you know, yeoman's work, the hard slogging of creating a stable state, and it requires years of constant effort. And he disappears from the historical record while he's doing this. And then in 539 BCE, he reappears again at the head of an army heading toward Babylon. Now, what Cyrus is going to do to Babylon is probably his crowning achievement in his career. And I have to remind myself that his career is already incredible. This is a guy who, by 539 BCE, has been a king for about 20 years. And in 20 years, he's taken his people from a virtual, you know, backwater, nowheresville, to a point where they've conquered half of the great nation states in their little ecosystem that exist, you know, after the fall of Assyria. And he's outside the gates of number three of four with an army. That's pretty awesome right there for a king of Anshan, who will very soon be referring to himself as part of his official royal titles as the king of the universe. When you go from Anshan to king of the universe, that's quite a jump. And he's kind of a self-made conqueror. You compare him to someone like Alexander the Great, who's, of course, awesome. But Alexander reminds you of sort of a historical rich kid who inherits his father's already thriving corporation with tons of ready cash and does great things with it. No offense uh, to Alexander, it's awesome. But Cyrus never had any of those advantages, and look where he is only 20 years into his reign. Now, let me just voice my own opinion that, that what Cyrus is about to do to Babylon is strange. You can't tell with the sources what's really going on, and the different histories have different approaches to it, and it's been argued about, and, and the views have changed and updated over time. There's just not enough hard sources, though, for anyone to really know, for anyone to conclusively win. I'm certainly not going to take a position on it, but I am going to explain sort of the weirdness of it. The first thing you have to ask is whether or not Cyrus arriving outside Babylon when he did was a coincidence. Because the timing is awesome if you're hoping to take over Babylon. Is that just because he gets lucky? Or is that just because, as the Babylonian propaganda would say later, the hand of Marduk had seized him and brought him to Babylon to get rid of the horrible king of Babylon and restore things? Just lucky? Or did Cyrus and the Persians have advanced information that things suck in Babylon right now? You come now, and half the population will be ready to welcome you with open arms. Was that maybe part of the reason he showed up when he did? Or, as some have argued for years, could you make a case that the reason that people were so disaffected in Babylon was in part due to Persian propaganda that undermined it? You know, the entire will to resist. And I have to be honest, I did not understand that part of the story for years growing up, but something has changed in the way historians view it, so it now makes more sense to me. When I was growing up, the attitude was that in 539 BCE, this is when Cyrus arrived. So something happens and occurs, and Babylon falls, and Cyrus takes it over, and there you go. So this idea that he had this propaganda undermining Babylon made you think about when. When was that going to happen? I mean, it just, everything happened so quickly. The modern way of viewing this amongst a lot of historians is that maybe the Persians and the Babylonians had been fighting battles for a couple of years, and that in 539, when Cyrus and his army show up outside of Babylon, that's like the end of the Second World War, when the Russians show up outside of Berlin and you're having your last climactic battle, you know, in a multi-battle long war. Again, the sources are just not there to confirm any of this, you know, categorically. But it would make a heck of a lot more sense if you were saying that Cyrus and the Persians were undermining the Babylonians with propaganda if you had years to do it, right? Now, understanding what Cyrus might have been doing requires talking about Babylon itself a little bit. Like the Assyrian city of Nineveh, this is a great urban center. And it's large enough and complex enough so that you see a lot of the same sorts of dynamics going on, you know, albeit through an ancient lens that you would see in any modern large city today. There are fissures, there are divisions, there are tensions, there are 
uh, disagreements. There, there are all sorts of things that if someone wanted to come in, they could widen the disagreements and slowly but surely increase the level of anger and discontent. There's a number of things to be exploited, too. Start with the fact that the king is unpopular. The king of Babylon during this time period almost certainly suffers from, from bad, bad historical publicity. His name is Nabonidus, and by the time all of this is going down, Nabonidus is about 70. 70 years old in a world, you know, where the lifespan is so much shorter. How many 70-year-old people are there? He's like a wizard, you know, to the population in terms of this is a guy whose memory goes back to events most people can't get anywhere near memory-wise. He may have been the general who helped seal the deal between those two sides at the Battle of the Eclipse. Remember when they suck each other's blood as part of, uh, you know, sealing the deal? This, this, this Nabonidus guy, when he was much younger and more vigorous, may have been one of the generals on site. Now he's old, and it's really hard to get your mind around what this guy was really like. He sort of portrayed as a, as a kind of a doting antiquarian by some historians. Some people consider him the first official archaeologist. I think that's got to be crazy because there were lots of earlier kings who were into digging up, you know, earlier versions of their civilization. But this guy is portrayed as somebody who almost prefers it to being a king. He'd rather be out there Indiana Jonesing some old Babylonian stuff from the previous kings than, than dealing with the day-to-day -day government. He also looks like a guy who doesn't mind getting out of Babylon. I have this image for the movie of some... I, I want to use, like, the guy who played the, the scientist, the doctor in Back to the Future and have him be Nabonidus and just have him sort of finding the hustle and bustle of Babylon too much and those young kids and their loud music and all that stuff. So he and the priesthood of Babylon, especially the main important god of Marduk, begin to have these disagreements. Now, understand something. In the world before modern times, there is really only one reliable counterbalance to the power of a king or an emperor or a pharaoh, and that's the priesthood and the religion, because the power that, that they have stems from the same source, right? You're, you're a king by divine right. It's the gods who want you to be a king. But who has a special relationship with the gods and who helps, you know, placate the gods and who does the work of the gods and who knows what the god really wants? Well, the priesthood and the religion, right? So the only other source of legitimate uh, power in these societies before modern times are often, you know, the priests. And the priests of Marduk don't like this Nabonidus guy. And part of the reason why is he seems to be kind of, well, favoring another god over theirs. This is what I mean by it's hard to get your mind around Nabonidus because he may be like an Akhenaten-type character. You know, the Egyptian pharaoh that may have been a monotheist and may have tried to change Egypt's religion. Another similar story, right, where you have the autocratic ruler opposed by a powerful priesthood, and after Akhenaten's time period gives the ultimate middle finger to the priesthood of Marduk by leaving Babylon and going to some Arabian oasis. Now, historians in modern times have found all sorts of really good, logical, patriotic reasons why the king might do that. In past times, it was much more portrayed like this guy is a mystic, either a mystic or an old man or a combination of the two, and he just wants to get away from his unworthy people, and he appreciates it more in, in these Arabian oases. It's probably what modern historians think. He's probably there doing important work for the country, but he's missing important work at the same time. The Babylonians required their king to be there once a year for a New Year's festival. It was important. He had to physically grasp the hand of the god in front of the population once a year to ensure success and good things and all these kinds of deals, and he stayed away for like a decade. And the Babylonian records will say every year the king was not here for the ceremony or what have you, and they're getting pissed. Then he's putting more money into creating more of these temples for the other religion, denying some money that the people of Marduk expect, and, and you can just see it, it boiling over, right? And then the king's not even there. His son Belshazzar is ruling as a uh, regent, and he's not popular either. So the king is part of it. But Babylon is going through, you know, tough economic times too, and that's putting the squeeze on people. They're having problems with disease, and that's causing unrest. Archaeologist Dr. Joan Oates describes 
you know, the down and dirty parts of, of, of day-to-day suffering. And let's remember something. Babylon's banking system and financial system was developed enough so that they had great banking houses there that were very powerful and lived on long after this period. And, 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 and that's just another one of those dynamics that makes us think about modern times. These are powerful interests that have, you know, some authority in the state. What happens when things seem to be falling apart and people are losing money and, and times are bad and, and you start getting Persian propaganda about this king who sounds like things are going his way, which, remember, during this time period might have caused a lot of people to figure the gods are smiling on that guy and our king's not even showing up to shake the god's hand every New Year's, right? Here's the way Dr. Joan Oates describes the situation in Babylon. Considering also, remember, that this king looks like a guy who's trying to change religious traditions, trying to change a bunch of other things, and, and Dr. Oates writes, quote, Clearly, Nabonidus' religious and administrative reforms provoked great resentment, while the wars and extensive building programs of his predecessors had proved a severe burden on the country's resources. Large numbers of economic texts reveal severe inflation, a situation now made worse by the spread of plague. Between 560 BCE and 550 BCE, prices rose by up to 50%, and from 560 to 485 BCE, the total increase amounted to some 200%. End quote. Not just that, but again, you know, take this with a grain of salt, it's argued about, but, but there are people inside Babylon who might be considered, shall we say, vulnerable to propaganda that created dissent. There are a lot of people in Babylon who are there because they were forcibly taken once upon a time from where they came from. And some of the propaganda afterwards, certainly the post-propaganda, but maybe some of the pre-propaganda too from Cyrus told these people that if the Persians were to take over, they'd get to go home. Start with the deportees from Judah, Jewish people today. There, there are still, I'm sure still, you know, even with all the troubles, Jews in that part of the world today that are descendants of people who were forcibly removed after the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem. What if Cyrus was telling those people, if I get, uh, if I get in power, you can go home? And what if he was telling all the other deportees the same thing? Now, when historians refer to Cyrus and the Persians' propaganda, the first idea that comes to mind is like negative propaganda, like the Nazi stuff designed to lie to people and get you to believe things that aren't true. But you could make a case that, that since we know that Cyrus and the Persians will eventually actually do what they're saying here, right? That they will, for example, allow the Jews to go back to Judah and reestablish their religion and even eventually, you know, pay for some of the rebuilding of the second temple, what will be the second temple with, with royal funds. When you know that they're actually going to do that, maybe you could say that this propaganda is a lot more like dropping leaflets over enemy military lines that say something like, you know, surrender to us, we don't hurt prisoners, and we'll give you a hot meal and, you know, a few bucks in your pocket and some cigarettes. What would they have done in the old days? Maybe this is like telling the people inside Babylon, do not fear, I may be coming, but I'm going to send you home. Now, real experts on this, like Pierre Briand, caution us against thinking about this the way that I just described to you, that this is a, a conscious policy of toleration. He says the way the marketing really is, is a lot more like Cyrus's Assyrian and Babylonian predecessors, where he's essentially promising continuity. And because continuity means allowing these people to do things the way that they're accustomed to do it, it seems like tolerance. And he points out that it's normal for conquerors in this region, even before this time period, to come in and promise to restore everything that's wrong. The gods are upset. I will fix that. The economy is bad. I will fix that. You are kept away from your home and your gods are just, you know, I will fix that. The restorer and recreator of order. So whatever you want to call this, in 539, Cyrus and the Babylonian army meet. And in a battle where there seems to have been a really maybe nasty massacre at the end, the Babylonian army is defeated. The rest of the troops sort of run back to the very formidable defenses of the city. And within two days, somehow, the gates of the city are opened and Cyrus's general is marching through the streets in triumph and Babylon falls. 
and Nabonidus flees, and he's eventually captured and supposedly treated well by Cyrus, just like all the other kings were. Herodotus, of course, has to give us a stratagem story of how it happened. This time it involves, you know, waiting until they can get the river down that flows through the city to a certain length or to a point where they, the troops can go through the marshes or what have you and capture the city. And I think he's one of the ones that say that the city didn't even know it was being captured because there was some, you know, revelry going on attached to a religious cult and the city so big anyway. I mean, modern excavations put the city size at over 2,000 acres and the wall circumference at about 11 miles. So it's possible that in one part of the city they were partying it up and, and the Persians got in. The natural thing to do would be to throw out a story like that and blame it on typical, you know, Greek stereotypes and whatnot. But it should be pointed out, one, that oftentimes in these ancient religions there was an awful lot of decadent or fun, or depends on your point of view, I guess, stuff that was part of you know, the religious rites, and you'll see this in Greece and Rome and a ton of other religions the world over, especially in the ancient period, and these people are immensely religious, the Babylonians especially. It's a holy city of Mesopotamia, right? These are very religious people. So imagine people with the commitment of like a Taliban, right? The seriousness with which they take this and this, the strident militancy and all that, but you might be commanded to party. It's a party for God, and if you're not there, the ramifications could be huge, right? I'm inclined to think that it's a Greek stereotype, of course, but there's a part of me that wants to believe it's the latter. Now, the one thing this conquest, if that's even the right word, of Babylon is known for is the fact that it's generally considered to be bloodless. I mean, forget that battle we talked about with the nasty potential massacre at the end. When the city of Babylon is taken, it's taken essentially voluntarily. I mean, it's like the Babylonians open up the door and Cyrus's general comes in. And 17 or so days later, Cyrus himself comes in. And we're told that the population, you know, gets in front of his chariot and lays down palm fronds and stuff, which some historians in the old days used to be sure was a sign of how much people wanted in there. More modern-day historians point out that that's generally how you get treated when you come into a city that's trying to show that they're no threat at all and please don't hurt us. That's perhaps what the Persian takeover of Babylon is most known for. Cyrus didn't hurt anybody. And as, as I said earlier, Nabonidus' life is spared, which supposedly is the same fate that Cyrus has meted out to all the kings he's faced, which, by the way, is not only unusual, but it's not even maybe true. Who knows? There are always little hints somewhere that maybe Cyrus killed these kings and the, and the propaganda covered it up. Nonetheless, historically and traditionally, he's supposed to have spared and given good lives to all these other kings he defeated. Astyages of the Medes, Croesus of the Lydians, now Nabonidus of the Babylonians. What is the message Cyrus is trying to send here? I mean, that's what I find interesting. You want to know a little bit about the guy himself and maybe what he was trying to do. What's the message when he does that? Because the Assyrian king who last conquered Babylon brags about how he tied the king of Babylon up like a pig and displayed him in the center of Nineveh. So this is not standard operating procedure. It's one of the things, by the way, that fascinates me about Cyrus, because the Occam's razor approach to history, which is the right way to go, I mean, what else are you going to do, is to assume the most logical things, right? You don't assume illogical things. So the assumption always is that someone like Cyrus is playing a hardcore, cynical propaganda game. And again, odds are he probably is. Most people would be. But occasionally you're going to get some different kind of human being because we see them. They exist. It's just if you're using the Occam's razor approach to try to determine, you know, what a Gandhi was really like a thousand years from now, you might be looking at, listen, Gandhi was really, um, you know, this was a cynical attempt to figure out a way to gain power, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you could figure out all these real logical reasons why a guy might do this. Sometimes people who are doing things for mystic reasons or morality reasons or humanistic reasons or any of these things, sometimes those people slip through the cracks because it's just so easy to assume they had a more real-world terra firma reason for doing things. Is it possible that Cyrus was kind of a humanist? Maybe, you know, this is how he's portrayed, by the way, by his real fans and a lot of people back in Iran. I mean, as the guy who invented human rights, sort of, at least as a you know, ruler is concerned. And Babylon is one of the number one pieces of evidence, you know, that gets trotted out in defense of this idea that this isn't just some sort of policy 
of tolerance for expediency's sake, that this is how Cyrus really believes you can govern. And it should be pointed out that, that not only has Babylon kind of surrendered without a fight, there's another Babylonian city or two that kind of opens their doors to Cyrus. And it's interesting because, you know, Riza Sargami has an interesting take on something that the Babylonian king did as part of the, the, the fighting with Cyrus for Babylon. Supposedly, and this is a way to look at Nabonidus showing that maybe he was this really responsible king after all. Before Cyrus gets to Babylon, Nabonidus goes around to all the surrounding towns and, and takes their gods, takes all their little the statues and the representations of their gods and takes them to Babylon. And traditionally, this is considered to be an act of safekeeping, right? You know, you don't want your Statue of Liberty falling into the hands of the Elamites and ending up in their trophy case, right? So you take all these village gods back to Babylon for safekeeping. Risa Sargami, though, has an interesting take on this. In his book, Discovering Cyrus, he does a great job reminding us of the interesting uh, belief systems of the people who have these gods, and then how maybe you could see what Nabonidus is doing is the equivalent of perhaps kidnapping the gods of these towns and holding them hostage for good behavior, right? Stay loyal to Babylon or your god gets it in the neck, something like that. Here's what Sargami writes. And remember, this only makes sense if Nabonidus is seriously worried that some of these towns are just going to go over to Cyrus because of the propaganda or whatever, he writes, quote, Faced with the very real prospect that his cities would open up their gates to the conqueror, Nabonidus settled upon a drastic policy. He decided to hold hostage the sacred idols of Babylonia's outlying cities to ensure the loyalty of their inhabitants. So when Cyrus and his army resumed their march in the late summer of 539 BCE, a series of caravans laden with divine images and other religious artifacts made its way to Babylon. Living today, we can hardly grasp the full psychological impact of Nabonidus's action. The idol was the centerpiece of the ancient Mesopotamian cult and the most important symbol of the community. The inanimate statues were treated like royalty, bathed, perfumed, groomed, and even fed lavish meals by an entourage of domestic servants, priests, and personal attendants. Ancient Mesopotamian cults were geographically centralized and the gods' powers territorially limited. That is why Cyrus could not receive the divine approval he desired with the gods concentrated in Babylon. He then continues, But Nabonidus was playing a dangerous game by emptying his cities of their idols. Proximity to the cult statue meant everything to the superstitious masses, who believed that the sacred images of their gods could perform miracles, cure illness, and most importantly, protect their settlements. Cities lost divine protection when their gods left. End quote. One of the first things that Cyrus will brag about doing when he takes over Babylon is returning all those gods to the outlying communities and those people freaking out at, you know, having their gods back. Once again, as Pierre Briand says, Cyrus is portraying himself as the restorer of order, of things as they should be. He's beginning to tie himself to the ancient Assyrian tradition. Some historians suggest consciously he'll talk about repairing something in the city and coming across some proclamation by Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian king. He'll tie himself to Assyria. And this ancient you know, royal tradition, when he starts calling himself king of kings and king of the universe, these are old Assyrian and even Akkadian terms. But if Cyrus was starting to use these ancient titles for himself, you can see why he thought he might deserve it. Because 80 or 90 years after you know, the ancient kingdom of Assyria fell, Cyrus had put Humpty Dumpty back together again with sort of a different form and different marketing and different branding. But all of a sudden, once again, just as had existed during later Assyrian times, one power had hegemony in that part of the world now. Trying to rule immensely different people, people from you know, everything from, from deeply urban environments in places like Babylon to Phoenician cities to tribes that existed off in the edges of the Eurasian steppe and incorporate all these different people 
into one empire. Much is made of the different strategies that the Persians used over the Assyrians. Instead of trying to shoo everybody into one, you know, cultural style, convert everybody to your religion, make good Assyrians of these conquered people, the Persians used a much lighter touch. The, the idea of toleration really was to allow local customs to continue. The Assyrians wouldn't have tolerated that. The fact that the Persians didn't try to change all that, whether it was a question of religion or language or anything else. In fact, when the Persian Empire gets up and running, Persians will be put in all the most important positions. But Persia will not be the language of the empire. There will always be only a tiny minority of people actually speaking Persian. All of the official you know, proclamations will be multilingual so the different people can read them. All the local gods are respected and supported. Now, again, is this some sort of, you know, humanitarian gesture on Cyrus's part? Or is it a guy who is a humanitarian and thinks, listen, I'm just telling you, this is the best way to treat people and it will work out best. In other words, a guy who believes his own humanitarian beliefs and morals dovetail into good outcomes. Or is it somebody who cynically looks at this and just says, listen, I'm just telling you, if we do it this way, we'll have less revolts. It'll be much better than the way the Assyrians did it. Who knows? It's tempting to think of Cyrus as brilliant and visionary, regardless of which one of those things is true. He organizes this empire. He starts creating things that are called satraps and satrapies, which are administrative units that will be built upon by his successors. And then the next major thing we hear about Cyrus, it's almost like, you know, when these people live that far back, you get the highlights of their lives, right? Highlight number one, you know, conquest of Medea. Highlight number two, conquest of Lydia. Highlight number three, conquest of Babylon. Highlight number four, the expedition against a queen of one of the most powerful tribal coalitions in Central Asia. Now, the fact that there is a queen involved in this story should tip you off to the idea that it's going to be a good one. And Herodotus, by the way, knows this. He's eager to get to this story, and he's going to spend a ton of time on it. He's been setting it up. He knows his audience is ready. He's got a little moral twist that may or may not have anything to do with reality. But you get a look at that 2,500-year-old mind that you're mind-melding with one way at this point in the story. But it becomes the time where Herodotus is at his least reliable, too. I mean, he jumps from highlight number three to highlight number four in Cyrus's life in one second. If you look at the actual dates involved, though, you'll see that there is like nine years between highlight number three and highlight number four, and nine years when Cyrus is, well, to use his own marketing and branding, king of the universe. What the heck was this guy doing for nine years? Well, he was putting out some propaganda, we know. Something called the Cyrus Cylinder is uh, famous. And it's this piece where first Cyrus has the Babylonian god saying, when I was with him, the whole power structure, and basically saying that king you defeated was the real weirdo that the god didn't want. I am restoring, you know, the kingship to the people that Marduk wants to have it. You can see that the same is true in a lot of the other, you know, religions that Cyrus is involved with. This is why a lot of people think his whole propaganda tolerance thing was much more of a political move, because look at how it helps him politically. In a way that, by the way, he could not have foreseen, it made him immortal. This is from Pierre Briand's book, From Cyrus to Alexander. But it's the translation from the Bible that he uses. In the same way that the Cyrus Cylinder says the Babylonian god Marduk took Cyrus's hand and, you know, swept away all the opposition. This is what the Israeli god Yahweh did, according to the Bible. Quote, Thus says Yahweh to his appointed, to Cyrus, whom he has taken by his right hand to subdue nations before him, and strip the loins of kings, to force gateways before him that their gates be closed no more. I will go before you leveling the heights. I will shatter the bronze gateways, smash the iron bars. I will give you the hidden treasures, the secret hoards, that you may know that I am Yahweh. End quote. So once again, Cyrus has these gods on his side. Why are they on his side? Well, he's always helping, isn't he? He's always doing what the priesthood of Marduk would like. And it's interesting how Marduk follows along. He likes if you treat his priests well. In the case of Yahweh, well, according to the Bible again, and Pierre Briand is skeptical of the details, but says in, in, in the bigger picture, at least, it was consistent with what actually happened. The Bible says that in the reign of a king 
two kings after, two official kings after Cyrus, they found the actual order that would have made Yahweh pleased with investing, shall we say, in the Cyrus conquests. According to the Bible and Pierre Briand's description of it, this is from Ezra, by the way, out of the royal archives of Ecbatana, the order said, quote, In the first year of Cyrus the king, King Cyrus decreed, Temple of God in Jerusalem. The temple will be rebuilt as a place at which sacrifices are offered and by which offerings are brought to be burnt. Its height is to be 60 cubits, its width 60 cubits. There are to be three thicknesses of stone blocks and one of wood. The expense is to be met by the king's household. Furthermore, the vessels of gold and silver from the temple of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the sanctuary in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, are to be restored, so that everything may be restored to the sanctuary in Jerusalem and put back in the temple of God. End quote. That dovetails nicely with that story of the ghostly hand, doesn't it? Because what that guy Belshazzar was drinking out of that made you know, Yahweh so mad to begin with are all these sacred vessels from the old temple in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple. Now Cyrus was decreeing that you rebuild Solomon's temple and you pay for it out of the king's treasury and you bring back all these things that are still around and restock the temple with them. And then you send the people who have been deported here back home. Now here's the thing. This reconstituted, you know, area that will become a satrap, by the way, does not have its political freedom. They're not going to be the way they were, you know, when the Babylonians and Egyptians were arguing over them. But you got to see that they're pretty darn far ahead. They went from a people that might have died out religiously in fact, the book I have that places Cyrus as one of the top, most 100 influential people of all time says that that's one of the things maybe you credit him with, the fact that if he doesn't do this, there's a chance Judaism doesn't continue over the long haul. In this case, he builds what's known as the second temple. And if you want to see continuity, the wall that is still one of the holiest, if not the holiest sites, I guess the Temple Mount would be holier, but, but it's part of the Temple Mount, is, is the famous you know, Western Wall. The Western Wall is a Roman-era addition to the Second Temple, which Cyrus allegedly, according to the Bible, paid for and authorized. It's so interesting, isn't it, to consider how connected the stories of the ancient Iranians, the ancient Persians are, to the ancient Jewish folks, especially considering the current antagonism between them. You know, as late as the 1970s, the Shah of Iran was, was touting this ancient closeness between the peoples and their relationship. If not for the ancient Persians and Iranians, there's a chance there wouldn't be Judaism today. And depending on when it died out, there's a very good chance you wouldn't have had the religions that sprouted off that branch. You wouldn't have had Christianity. You probably wouldn't have had Islam. In other words, if Cyrus the Great actually did do this, and he had never lived to do it, what would the world look like today? Another thing it says in that 100 most influential people of all time that I thought was interesting is that many of the people that get credited as being very important and dynamic and instrumental human beings in terms of their effect on history did something that would have been done anyway. Might not have been done at that time or that way, but a lot of this stuff would have happened. Someone else would have discovered the light bulb probably. The author thought it likely that if Cyrus the Great had never lived, None of this stuff happens. He was a unique individual. And even though you can't get your mind around the specifics of how he was a unique individual, you can sort of look at what built up. Even if Pierre Briand's right, and you have to assume that there was a lot of foundation bubbling up, up under the surface for Cyrus to work with, this is still a pretty incredible human being. I think you could probably say, with a decent chance of being right, that he is in the 530s BCE, the greatest geopolitical figure who's ever lived. Which makes the next thing I'm going to say, you know, so hard to believe. You know, why should I say it? How about letting historian A.T. Olmsted, in a book published in 1948, say it? And again, is there any more of a telling example that these people live at the very tail end of the black and white era of recording of human history because how can this guy be as big as he is and yet this next line be true Olmsted said quote 
Here we must leave Cyrus, for suddenly and without warning, our information comes to an end. End quote. Two hundred years after this period, we will know Alexander the Great's symptoms to such a degree that doctors today try to diagnose what he may have died of. And they still don't know. I'm not saying everything's perfect. But you know where, when, the hows, the whys. How can you not know how this guy dies? Highlight number four in his life, as portrayed by Herodotus, is Herodotus' story of how he dies. And I love the fact that Herodotus goes to, you know, the trouble to point out that he's heard several different versions of this story, but the one he's going to give you is the one he thinks is most likely. And maybe it's just a coincidence that the story that Herodotus thinks is most likely is the one with the most exotic, interesting, movie-like elements to it you can imagine. I can't imagine he left a better version on the table somewhere saying, nope, you know, I just don't believe that because the one he used is so awesome. Now, is it believable? That's the problem here. Nobody knows what's believable. Off the top of my head, if you asked me what percentage bought into the general idea of Herodotus' story, I'd say it's like 80%. Most of them don't believe any of the details, but the broad idea that in 530 BCE, Cyrus the Great died somewhere out in this steppe area, as Herodotus said, details probably unknown. About 20%, I'd say, of the historians, though, think he died a completely different way. Some think against different tribes than Herodotus says in different areas. Others that he didn't die that way at all. Xenophon, writing a couple centuries afterwards, will say he died in bed, peacefully. So there are some historians who buy that, too. In Iran, it's a generally, I think, a higher percentage of historians that think he didn't die the way Herodotus says. And in part, you, you can understand why you'd be a little skeptical. It's just too darn interesting the way Herodotus does it. You can see... You know, the admonition that I got when I was starting in journalism, the one that said, you know, tell what really happened in the most interesting way possible. What happens to an admonition like that if there's no way you could possibly know what really happened? But you have to tell it anyway. What are your standards then? You're pretty much left with the most interesting way you can at that point, right? Well, the story, as Herodotus tells it, involves this little twist. You're going to end up leaving his theatrical presentation with a deeper message. Again, the deeper message may or may not be true. Herodotus couches this story now into the idea of overreach, maybe the idea of absolute power corrupting absolutely. And before we write this off, as many historians do right away, because it's just such an obvious moral message, remember, you could make that case about Hitler, you know, with the absolute power turning you mad after a while with Alexander, you can make that case. I mean, I guess there are historical figures where this is both a motif, because it's this recurring theme you see all the time, but it also happens to be true. Maybe after years of being king of the universe, Cyrus got a little full of himself, who knows, but that's the way this is portrayed, right? There's going to be an object lesson here. And the person that is going to stick it to Cyrus and teach him this lesson is going to be a queen. You know, but you have to think of like an Amazonian queen. This isn't some woman who's walking around in velvet, you know, on a throne being fanned. I mean, this is a person who probably once upon a time was killing men in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, did this woman really exist? Who the heck knows? There's no historical confirmation that I've ever seen that says that they found anything that proves this queen, whose name, by the way, I used to call her Tamiris when I was growing up, but I've seen Timorous, Tomaris, number of different pronunciations. I think Shakespeare might have used her as a character in one of his plays. Nonetheless, you can say a couple of things. One, it wouldn't have been outrageous to think of her as a female warrior because these tribes actually had them. It may have been the actual root of the idea of Amazons in sort of a mythology. So she could have actually been a killer warrior. And also, the tribe she was supposed to have led was real, all too real to some people. They were called the Massagatai, or the Massagatai. A dangerous, powerful, numerous tribal coalition that, you know, Herodotus in his writings, he has to set it up and tell you what he knows, which isn't much. He, he says, I hear they're a Scythian people, which they kind of were. You have to think of Mongol-type culture but with people who were probably predominantly light-skinned 
and ranging on the scale of looks from like a Turkic kind of look all the way up to people with blonde and red hair, blue and green eyes, tall. There's a little Viking side to them, a little bit of the Viking ethos and, you know, sword worshipping and things like that. Supposedly once a year these people would have a scaffold erected and they'd put a sword on top of the scaffold and then they would march underneath the scaffold one out of every 100 prisoners that they'd captured over the year and execute them as a sacrifice to the, you know, sky god, the sun god, Mithra, I think it was. These are colorful, scary people, just what you want in a story like this. Herodotus has already talked about their head hunting, the fact that they make, you know, drinking cups out of skulls, and the really nasty warriors are the ones with the most cups. He talks about their cannabis use. Again, this is the exotic barbarian. You want to hear what they do? He says they found this fruit that they can burn, and then they sit around the fire burning the fruit, and it gets them intoxicated like wine gets Greeks intoxicated. So another little bit of that barbarian color to throw in. He also points out, according to him, that they're very promiscuous. You might call them free love types or swingers, maybe. Anybody can sleep with anybody else's wife. He just has to put his bow, you know, alongside their tent to let them know you're interested, I guess. So weed smoking, head hunting, blood drinking, wife sharing, Viking types. Who would not want that in a good story? If you don't know anything and you're just trying to make the best story, make sure you include these people. Herodotus says that Cyrus leads an army up to this queen's territory and then basically proposes marriage to her. So it would be like a diplomatic alliance thing. And Herodotus says that she sees through this ruse immediately, saying that he just wants to conquer her people by marrying her. So then when she says no... He begins to try to set up what we would call today an amphibious river crossing. There's a big river that divides the territory he's coming from, from the territory of these Central Asian horse nomads up in places like, you know, Kazakhstan and places like that today. And as Cyrus and the Persians were told are building these boats, some of which have like towers, like fighting towers on them, she sends him a message. Now remember, she's going to be like the voice of avenging karma here in teaching Cyrus a lesson. So her voice and the words that Herodotus puts in her mouth from a screenwriter, showrunner's point of view, are designed to, you know, set this idea up, right? You should know, but you don't, you know, you're gonna get what's coming to you. Here's what Herodotus says. This is the De translation of Herodotus, by the way, quote, King of the Medes, I advise you to abandon this enterprise, for you cannot know if in the end it will do you any good. Rule your own people, and try to bear the sight of me ruling mine. But of course you will refuse my advice, as the last thing you wish for is to live in peace. Listen then, if you are so bent upon trying your strength against the Masakatai, give up the laborious task of building that bridge, and let my army withdraw three days' march from the river, and then you come over yourself. Or if you prefer it, retire the same distance yourselves, and let us meet you on your side of the river. End quote. This barbarian warrior queen is basically saying to a guy whose title includes king of kings and king of the universe to come and get it, or I'll come over and take it from you. That's a pretty strong female character, isn't it? And I was thinking that it makes Herodotus at times look a little pro-feminist, right? Like, he, like he's been looking for a good, strong female character. There's another reason maybe that would play well. Maybe some of the people in his audience are women, and it would be good to have a character that they could both relate to and cheer for. Finally, it might just be a dig at the manliness of the Persians, right? I mean, here's the greatest king that Asia has ever produced, and he's about to be beaten and killed by a woman? Nonetheless, in the story, when she says, you know, do you want it over here, do you want it over there, Cyrus and his you know, generals and whatnot sit down and have a conference about this. What do we do? Which choice do we take? And all his advisors say, let her come to our side of the river. One advisor, though, says, no, 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 go over to her side. That advisor is our old friend, the king of Lydia, Croesus, who instead of being killed, Herodotus has, you know, going in the story, sort of acting as advisor to Cyrus all the way through. And Croesus' advice is totally different. First of all, he says you can't. Let her come over here and give ground in front of her. It's a woman. It would look terrible. So there's that other little dig. He says, go over to her side. And then he says, 
and how about we do a little trick? And he proceeds to tell Cyrus that they should essentially do the same thing to these people that the Medes did to either these people or their cousins a generation before in a story you may recall. Get them all drunk and kill them. My DeSelencourt translation has Croesus telling Cyrus to do it this way, quote, Here then is my advice. Cross the river, advance to the limit of the enemy's withdrawal, and then get the better of them by a piece of strategy. I have heard that these people have no experience of such luxuries as the Persians enjoy, and know nothing about the pleasures of life. Let us take advantage of this fact, and set out a banquet in our camp, on the most generous scale, with a great many sheep slaughtered and dressed, all sorts of other dishes, and bowls of strong wine in liberal quantities. Then when the banquet is all prepared, he says, let us march back to the river, leaving only a detachment of inferior troops behind. Unless I'm very much mistaken, when our enemies see all those good things, they will set to work upon them, and that will be our chance to distinguish ourselves by a bold stroke. End quote. Again, is that a recurring motif, or is that just a tactic that seems to work quite a bit? Who knows? But in the story, we're told that the a third of the army shows up kills the inferior troops, sees all the food and the wine, proceeds to get, you know, very full and very drunk, and then the Persians come in, kill a bunch of them, and capture some others, about a third of the army, according to Herodotus. Included amongst the prisoners, a general, who also happens to be this barbarian queen's son. So now in this scenario, Herodotus is playing with his movies turned into a little bit of a thriller with a little chess match, and all of a sudden Cyrus' side has captured a major piece, the son of the queen. And so she issues one of these, I'll let you go now if you give me back my son, kinds of speeches. From the Purvis translation, Herodotus says, quote, when Tamyris learned what had happened to her army and her son, she sent a herald to Cyrus with this message. Bloodthirsty Cyrus, do not gloat over what has happened here. You Persians indulge yourself with the fruit of the vine to the point of madness, so that the wine descends into your bodies. Ugly words flow up and out of you. By such means you have tricked me, and you've taken my son prisoner, but not by supremacy in battle. Well then, I urge you to follow this advice. Return, my son, to me, and despite the damage you have cunningly wreaked upon a third part of the army of the Massagetai, you may leave this land unharmed. If you do not do this, I swear by the son, the lord of the Massagetai, that I will satisfy your thirst for blood, insatiable as you are. End quote. So what's Cyrus going to do with this interesting, powerful chess piece? He doesn't get the chance to decide because we're told that as soon as the queen's son sobers up, finds himself, you know, hands tied or bound, he beseeches Cyrus to undo his hands. Somehow Cyrus is convinced, and I like the way my Rawlinson translation puts it, the minute his hands were free, Rawlinson's Herodotus says he destroyed himself. So he committed suicide. Now all of a sudden, Cyrus just lost his peace. And this is when we're told the battle happens. This from the DeSelencourt translation, quote, The queen, on hearing that Cyrus ignored her terms, engaged him in the field with all the forces she possessed. The battle which followed, I judge, to have been more violent than any other fought between foreign nations. According to the information that I have, the engagement began with the two armies coming to a halt within range of each other and exchanging shots with bows and arrows until their arrows were used up, after which there was a long period of close fighting with spears and daggers, neither side being willing to retreat. Finally, however, the Massagetai got the upper hand. The greater part of the Persian army was destroyed where it stood, and Cyrus himself was killed. He had been on the throne for twenty-nine years. End quote. Of course, that doesn't quite twist the knife enough and have you leaving the performance really thinking about some of the greater themes in life. So Herodotus, from my Purvis translation, adds a coda to the story. He writes, quote, 
Queen Temerus then filled a wineskin with human blood and searched for the corpse of Cyrus amongst the Persian dead. When she found him, she thrust his head into the wineskin, and as she thus abused the corpse, she declared to it, I am alive and have conquered you in battle, but you have ruined me by taking my son through guile. Well then, just as I threatened, I will slake your thirst for blood. End quote. So if, as the recurring Greek motif will later show, that the Persians are surreal overreachers, I'm sure Herodotus' attitude here is that they should have learned their lesson with Cyrus. By the time Cyrus exits the scene, though, he's built an empire that stretches from you know, modern-day Pakistan all the way to the Mediterranean, up into Turkey, down by the Red Sea, to the borders of Egypt, and out to the Central Asian steppe. When he's taken, you know, efforts and, and, and spent years organizing it and putting it in a form where it has a chance to live on after he's gone. Nonetheless, you cannot lose a person of that magnitude. You cannot lose an Alexander. You cannot lose a Napoleon. You cannot lose and have these people from such lofty heights removed from the scene without there being this huge vacuum. A couple hundred years after this time period, one of the people who will fill a vacuum and play a similar role and maybe eclipse this person will visit his tomb, Alexander the Great, along with some influential colleagues, will go to the spot and the building that is assumed to be the tomb of Cyrus the Great. That tomb is still standing, by the way, in modern-day Iran, if indeed it was the tomb. It's interesting to think of Alexander climbing up there in a fully colorized historical era now, by the way, bringing with him people who will write about it afterwards. We actually have, through another guy, the writings of someone who was with Alexander and kind of describes what the tomb looked like. A lot of clothing, a lot of souvenirs, a lot of things that just sort of help the guy into the afterlife sort of deal. And then a body that was preserved in wax, we're told. This, this was kind of a Persian custom, too. Now, this might just be me, but I had this feeling that if the queen of the Masajidi or the Masagatai had taken his head or something, that's a mutilation that they would have probably told us about. It's probable that the body looked pretty darn good because no one talked about it looking any other way. We're told that there was an inscription on the tomb. Now, some historians think it must have been in front of the tomb because it's missing, but there were a couple of different descriptions from people who supposedly saw them. Some are more flowery than others. One that I like that has a couple of different versions says, quote, Mortal! I am Cyrus, son of Cambyses, who founded the Persian Empire and was king of Asia. Grudge me not then my monument. End quote. But there are other traditions, also from eyewitness accounts originally, that record a very different sort of epitaph. Some of the historians I like say it's much more traditionally Iranian, too. It's much more pithy and right to the point. The Persians, when they were leading the empire, could put on the airs as well as any Mesopotamian dynasty ever did. They could heap on all the traditional titles. Queen Victoria had the Empress of India. The kings of this area had King of the Universe, King of the Four Corners of the Earth, King of Lands, and the Persians could do that. But sometimes when they were just recording for eternity, which is what a tomb inscription like this is, they adopted a different style. And the tomb inscription, supposedly from an eyewitness that I like the most, and I like to use Cyrus's persian e Greekish form of the name, Korosh or Kurosh. It says, Here I lie, Kurosh, King of Kings. The Persians grew up in the equivalent of a tough neighborhood. The show you just heard involved a lot of context, didn't it, where we discussed the background, where they sprung from, because this does a bunch of things. One, it makes their achievements all the more astounding. I mean, they arose in this world with all these amazing competitors and managed to 
you know, climb to the top of the heap anyway. It also helps us set a baseline for comparison. When we say things like the Persians are tolerant or lenient, you want to immediately say, compared to what? The show you just heard gives us some idea what they might be compared to. Finally, it's a fantastic story, this story that's usually relegated to dead air between two other stories, right? Somewhere between the fall of Assyria and the rise of Persia is the you know, latter part of the 600s and the high 580s, you know, like 595, 585. What's going on during that era? Normally, it's sort of just a transition point between you know, two chapters in a book, whereas all by itself, it's twisted and fascinating. And I love the idea of the great power like the U.S. or the Soviet Union collapsing and the rest of the world sort of looking at each other over the, you know, smoke and ruins trying to figure out who gets what and what do things look like now. I love that. The key to this whole story at this point is, you know, when it took such a singular figure to put this improbable, you know, event together, what happens when that figure exits the scene? What are the odds of getting two Cyrus the Greats in the same family, one right after another? Remember, this is the largest empire in world history. The distance from one part to another is daunting. Then you have all these different people, peoples that are very independence-minded and fractious and who gave the Assyrians fits all the time. So many different religions, so many different languages. How is you know, one small minority of people going to rule this giant entity, especially without the specially gifted guy who built the whole thing. In the next episode, we'll examine how, you know, Cambyses, the son of Cyrus, manages all this. And there will be coups, and there will potentially be armies disappearing in sandstorms. There will be... also spreads. What you're about to hear is part two of a multi-part series on the Achaemenid Persian Empire and especially its dealings with the Greeks. I suggest getting part one and listening to that first before you dive into this, but listen, I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. You do anything you want. I would like to point out that this is the Dan Carlin version of this story, which is always what you get with me, which may or may not correspond to the traditional way these things are told. So please listen at your own risk. And if it sparks a, an interest in the subject, I'll be very happy about that. Nonetheless, without further ado, and with proper warnings in place, this is Kings of Kings, part two. December 7th, it's history. 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The events. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. <laughs> Not quite to the noise, man. The figures. From this time and place. I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Violiner. Mr. Gorbachev, the drama, tear down this wall. Gate 6 to Manhattan, urgent. Marine 6, Tower 2 has had a major explosion and what appears to be a complete collapse surrounding the entire area. I welcome this kind of the examination because questions. people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. If we dig deep in our history and our doctrine and remember that we are not descended from fearful men. It's hardcore history. How many people out of a hundred that you could name, either people that you knew or people that you've heard of or read about, how many people out of a hundred do you think could handle absolute power without totally losing their mind? And if you could handle it initially, if you could find that well-balanced person who could deal with it initially, what about dealing with it for the long haul? Because, you know, history shows that there are a lot of people that, you know, the power gets to you over time. It eats at you slowly. I mean, if you could handle absolute power initially, could you handle it for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years? Those of us in 
democratic systems tend to assume, because it's kind of built into the thinking of our political systems, that nobody can handle absolute power. Or that it's certainly an unbelievably small number, right? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. How long have we all heard that term? And we assume it's a truism. I know I do. And yet I can prove myself wrong pretty easily by looking back at the past and realizing that by that sort of rationale, shouldn't every emperor and king throughout history that had either close to or de facto absolute power, shouldn't they all be crazy? Shouldn't they all lose their minds? And while you could certainly say most of them probably lost perspective of, for example, what life was like for normal people, the vast majority of them didn't go crazy, which might be more interesting than assuming the opposite, although we all know of the high-profile examples, don't we? And, you know, I'll use the classic ones. Why not go right to Godwin's law? I mean, look at Hitler. You could say maybe it was a form of Parkinson's disease or maybe the Dr. Feelgood drugs he was being shot up with. At the same time, by the end of his rule, he's exhibiting the classic symptoms of megalomania and paranoia that come with the absolute power sort of stereotype. Look at a guy like Alexander the Great. I mean, he's almost another kind of Godwin's law, isn't he, especially with this program. By his early 30s, he's as paranoid and as megalomaniacal as Hitler is. And again, maybe some of that's connected to what a lot of historians would call rampant and terminal, maybe, at the point he was at alcoholism. Who knows? It's difficult to separate. But Alexander seemed to be able to handle power initially, and then somewhere along the line, he couldn't. And the sources at the time, by the way, write about this growing megalomania and paranoia. Not very fair sources, maybe, too. Let's acknowledge that. When the near-legendary and enormous historical figure of Cyrus the Great that we talked about in the first part of this story, when he dies or is killed in 530 or 529 BCE, he bequeaths to his son the most dangerous inheritance I can imagine. He leaves him the empire that he had just won. And by doing so, he both creates an immense challenge for his son to overcome, absolute power or something very close to it and what that can do to him, but also he hands his son something that is so valuable that immediately other entities are going to be tempted by it. It's like leaving him gold and jewels, which, you know, in effect he really did leave him, and then sending him out at two in the morning to walk down the most crime-ridden street in town. You're always going to be looking over your shoulder, and there may be other people very tempted by what you have. Cyrus the Great's oldest son was named Cambyses. Officially, it's Cambyses II. As part of what made Cyrus such a visionary ruler, he paid a lot of attention before his death to making sure that there would be a smooth transition of power from him to his you know, designated successor. This is an era in human history where this was a very precarious affair a lot of the time. I mean, we take for granted in our democratic systems today that the transfer of power will be relatively smooth, and we consider it a really big deal in a constitutional crisis if, you know, we can't name the winner at the end of the day, you know, on an election day, and if it has to go to a court, and if there's challenges to, you know, ballots in this state or that state, that's a huge deal. In the ancient Near East, in West Asia, in the period we're talking about here, all kinds of nightmares happened, and any king or ruler would have known about them. There would be revolutions and coups and assassinations, and sons would, would kill their parents and go to war with each other. I mean, my favorite story about these kinds of affairs, and it's, it's a classic case, I guess you could say. The rule-proving classic case is the Assyrian king Sennacherib, who famously destroyed Babylon and then lost his life supposedly while praying at the hands of at least one and maybe two of his sons. And in one tradition, by the way, killed with a statue that represented Babylon. So you get that wonderful, you know, ancient history tie-in that the authors from ancient times all like, where, you know, there's a certain karmic justice here. You destroyed Babylon, and then the god of Babylon gets back at you. And then his sons go to war with each other, the tale tells. And a third son, maybe, comes in, defeats both of them, and then takes over the throne. Sounds perverse, but not that unusual. And a guy like Cyrus the Great would have understood 
you know, the pitfalls, right? There's going to be a ton of entities out there that want the power that you just created. Remember, Cyrus is a guy who, in the space of a single reign, admittedly long reign, took his people from a geographical backwater on the world stage and made them the masters of the greatest empire the world had ever seen. A guy whose initial title when he came to the throne was King of Anshan, and whose titles when he died were things like King of the World, King of the Four Corners of the Earth, King of the Universe. As we said in the first part of this show, that's a heck of a promotion in one lifetime. And while it's hard enough for the self-made individual that makes that progress in the space of a lifetime, how much harder might it be for people who simply have that handed to them, the second generation or the third generation who begins to live a lifestyle that's different and expects these sorts of things? You can see Cyrus training his son for years before his demise to make him you know, ready, essentially on-the-job training. He's going to hand over the family business to his son, and so his son gets to be the viceroy of Babylon for a while, gets to hang out with the army for a while, do this, do that. He's learning how to be the king of kings. I wonder if that somehow increases your chances that you can do so without losing your mind and your perspective. Cyrus also brokers an important deal because he has more than one son, And, you know, if you look back at even recent history, a guy like Cyrus would have been able to notice how much of a problem you have when you have more than one possible inheritor to the throne. Cyrus, in addition to his oldest son, Cambyses, has another one, known by multiple names. The most common, probably to be mispronounced by yours truly, is Bardia. He's the younger son. And according to the ancient sources, take this for what it's worth, When Cyrus is crafting essentially his will, his inheritance, the deal, he makes Cambyses the next king of kings, but he gives sort of a consolation prize to the younger brother, right? You you lose out on the the fruits of empire, but here is your runner-up gift. He gives to him a large territory in Central Asia to govern and apparently says that unlike all the other territories that are being governed in the name of the king, you can keep the taxes and the tribute you know, from your places. You still are beholden to your older brother, but you have a nice little, you know, place to call your own, sort of, and uh, and keep the money. And initially, this seems to work rather well, because when Cyrus dies, the transition to his chosen successor seems to be relatively seamless. And then things begin to get corrupted. So corrupted, in fact, that you actually have to look at the end of Cambyses' reign and then work backward to the beginning because what happens at the end changes, corrupts, and alters all that we know about the reign. Cambyses II's reign is going to be like a game of Clue. Did you ever play that game where you know you have to figure out the murder mystery and the weapon and what room it happened and it was Colonel Mustard in the library with the candlestick trying to figure out the reign of Cambyses and who this guy was is a little like trying to figure out the whodunit of the game of Clue because something happens to Cambyses and it might be that he goes insane because he can't handle the amount of absolute power he has. That's what the ancient sources indicate, right? Herodotus basically says Cambyses lost his mind. But a lot of modern historians don't buy that at all. They see a cover-up a conspiracy, something that would not be unfamiliar to people who read, you know, things about the John F. Kennedy assassination and conspiracy tales about that because there's something about the demise of Cambyses that looks a lot like one of those John F. Kennedy assassination conspiracy books or several of them. What's more, the people that may have gotten the king of kings, the founder of the Persian Empire's son out of the way, may have been the ones who got to then decide how the history about him was written. And that has colored everything we know about the second ruler of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, a guy who had the very unenviable task of trying to follow a legend. I mean, who could follow Alexander the Great? Well, nobody. They ripped his empire apart and started fighting over it rather quickly. Who could follow Adolf Hitler if his dreams of a thousand-year Reich even partially came true? You can't even imagine it, can you? Hitler's personality and DNA was 
entwined all throughout the idea of the Third Reich. You can't even imagine anyone succeeding him in any sort of a realistic way, right, as opposed to, you know, Admiral Donuts who succeeds him for a couple days to sign the peace agreement. Who could succeed Napoleon? Cambyses II is in an unenviable position. But if modern historians are to be believed, and I shouldn't see why they shouldn't be, he did a pretty good job for the time he had available to him. Was he insane? That's a much harder one to figure out. Depends on who you believe. But if he was, sure wouldn't be hard to imagine why, how many people that you know out of a hundred could handle absolute power. The idea that Cambyses was insane and that he did all these crazy things was one that took hold way back in ancient times and persisted up until really like the 1960s or 1970s. Will Durant in 1935, a great historian writing an outdated history, did a wonderful job, and by the way, taking it at face value, giving you the traditional Cambyses story, and it's a litany of horrors, but it's fascinating as heck. I mean, if you're Herodotus, and we describe the ancient Greek historian as an ancient screenwriter or script runner, if you're Herodotus, don't you want a nice half-mad Persian king to play around with? Because think about the possibilities inherent in that, right? Here's the way Will Durant describes this in 1935, again, taking the entire story at face value, but essentially giving you the story as it was understood and believed to have happened for thousands of years. He writes, starting to talk about Cyrus, Cambyses' father, and contrasting and comparing them. He says, quote, One great defect had sullied his character, meaning Cyrus's character, occasional and incalculable cruelty. It was inherited, unmixed with Cyrus's generosity, by his half-mad son. Cambyses began by putting to death his brother and rival. He means Bardia, he says Smerdis. I told you the guy had a lot of names. By putting to death his brother and rival Smerdis. Then, lured by the accumulated wealth of Egypt, he set forth to extend the Persian Empire to the Nile. He succeeded, but apparently at the cost of his sanity. Memphis was captured easily, but an army of 50,000 Persians sent to annex the oasis of Amun perished in the desert, and the expedition to Carthage failed because the Phoenician crews of the Persian fleet refused to attack a Phoenician colony. Cambyses lost his head and abandoned the wise clemency and tolerance of his father. He publicly scoffed at the Egyptian religion and plunged his dagger derisively into the bull revered by the Egyptians as the god Apis. He exhumed mummies and pried into royal tombs, regardless of ancient curses. He profaned the temples and ordered their idols to be burnt. He thought in this way to cure the Egyptians of superstition. But when he was stricken with an illness, apparently epileptic convulsions, the Egyptians were certain that their gods had punished him and that their theology was now confirmed beyond dispute. As if again to illustrate the inconveniences of monarchy, Durant writes, Cambyses, with a Napoleonic kick in the stomach, killed his sister and wife, Roxana, slew his son, Prezaspes, with an arrow, buried twelve noble Persians alive, condemned Croesus to death, repented, rejoiced to learn that the sentence had not been carried out, and then punished the officers who delayed in executing it. On his way back to Persia, he learned that a usurper had seized the throne and was being supported by widespread revolution. From that moment, he disappears from history. Tradition has it that he killed himself. End quote. If you're the ancient screenwriter that is Herodotus, you love this guy as a story element. But is it true? Trying to investigate, you know, what happened here is like going into a crime scene and being an investigator. I've often thought that history is like a crime scene. And, you know, I am not a historian. I'm an admirer from afar. But I love those moments where historians are put into the sort of the Joe Friday, the Sergeant Joe Friday, or the, as I said, Columbo mode, and go into the game of Clue and start investigating what happened. And the guys from Durant's era and earlier, they're sort of like old-timer investigators. They go out there, they interview the witnesses, and they try to figure out what happened, and they give you the story as they understand it. But they don't have modern-day techniques, right? It's like investigating the Kennedy assassination, you know, with techniques from the early 1960s or being able to have it happen today and investigate it with DNA evidence and modern-day ballistics and, you know, and audio samples and cameras on every street corner. 
I mean, the difference is, you know, astonishing. And when modern-day historians go back and examine this case, they break it down to the same sorts of things you would if you were Sergeant Joe Friday going into the scene. You'd start looking at the physical evidence, right? The blood spatter and the fingerprints. That's the archaeological stuff. And you start comparing that to the stories you've got from the witnesses and the different people around, you know, the neighborhood. They're the, you know, written sources and the stuff that's come down to us. And you start compiling sort of a, you know, a composite of what the person, the victim, was like. And then maybe you send investigators down to the city hall and you start looking at the paper trail and see if there's any, you know, records on this person, arrest records, real estate transactions, anything like that. Those are the, you know, ancient sources like the Babylonian tablets that they've found. And you try to compile some sort of a semblance of what happened based on, you know, the total view of the evidence. The story that Cambyses is insane comes from some of the, you know, witnesses at the crime scene. And they may have been giving you the information secondhand, and it may have come from biased sources. But if you're investigating, you know, this crime scene, you'll start with just the facts, as Sergeant Joe Friday might have said. The facts of Cambyses the Second Reign that you can say with certainty is that he, you know, ruled for about eight years, from about 530 BCE to about 522 BCE. He was the king that first really gave the Persian Empire a naval capability. And this may not sound like a big deal, but really it made them the first of the powers that were based in Mesopotamia and that area of the world to have any sort of significant naval capability ever. People like the Assyrians might have had the tribute and the, the nominal allegiance of some of these coastal cities on the Mediterranean, may have even been able to operate some coastal forces or forces in freshwater areas. But the Persians become the first of these people to have a fleet which is significant on the Mediterranean naval world stage. And it should be. They take over the one that was probably the best in the Mediterranean up until that time. They start absorbing Phoenician cities with the fabulous Phoenician navies. And the way the Persians governed, they didn't create their own navy or they didn't take the Phoenicians and, and make them as a base to start their own. They simply went in there and sort of subcontracted it and said, well, listen, what you have to offer the empire, militarily speaking, is, you know, you already have a fleet. So when we need a fleet, your fleet is our fleet and you'll run it and you know what you're doing and there'll be a bonus in it for you if you do well. The Assyrians would have said something like, you perform well or else. The Persians probably said something like, you know, you perform well and there'll be a little something extra at the end of the year. So Cambyses is the guy that does that. And that makes a huge difference in the story that's about to happen because if the Persians don't have any naval power, well, a lot of the things that, you know, occur in the rest of their history can't. For example, the other thing Cambyses is absolutely known for and that's a physical fact, and that's that he's the king of kings that takes over Egypt. Something that requires, by the way, this navy in order to do, and that completes the conquest of his father. Remember, his father, you know, when he first started off conquering things, there were four kind of superpowers in the world at that time, or their version of the world. Cyrus conquered three of them. His son conquered the remaining one. And Egypt was a great state pretty much always. They were no pushover, although not a lot is known about you know, the fighting and the battles and all that sort of stuff. There were some decent stories. One of the more perverse that one of the ancient sources wrote, you know, probably totally false, but said that the Persians took advantage of the ancient Egyptians' reverence for cats and strapped cats to their shields so that the Egyptian archers would be, you know, unsure of how to react to that. That would be exactly the kind of you know, image that a Herodotus-type character would love to share with an audience. That's a colorful anecdote, isn't it? But Herodotus himself says he actually saw bone fields in Egypt from some of these battles, and that would have been, you know, 75 years after the fact or something. So it would be very interesting. It's not like Herodotus to lie about what he actually sees or what he actually talks to somebody about seeing. Herodotus tells a story from the fighting that says that the Persians at one point, and this would be very like them, by the way, because didn't we talk about in the last program that they essentially did this with the Greeks and with other peoples. They sent envoys to the Egyptian defenders at one point, probably trying to offer them a typical Persian deal, you know. Um, you give up this fight, we'll all benefit, blah, 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 it'll be great, you know. 
Um, and it must have been a sizable delegation because Herodotus says that the Egyptians seized the delegation and tore them limb from limb. And pretty much at any time in history, just about anywhere you go, envoys and, and ambassadors and whatnot are untouchable. I mean, there, there are usually very strong reasons to not abuse the envoys of another country, and the Persians are no example. And as we said in the last episode, the Persians are a very lenient empire, sort of graded on a curve, but they could be just as nasty as their predecessors in the region, you know, when they decided they wanted to send a message. And the Persians were very good at knowing who to send it to. Herodotus tells a story, who knows if it's true or not, about what the Egyptian punishment was when they lost the war and someone had to pay for the treatment of those envoys who were so horribly abused. Herodotus has Cambyses right after he captures Egypt, summoning the Egyptian elite to the capital at Memphis to watch a demonstration of what happens to people who break the law. And I keep trying to imagine what a scene like this is like. It must have been, you know, intense enough with an oral historian like Herodotus talking about it to an audience. I can't imagine what the big screen modern day blockbuster movie would be like. But here's what Herodotus says, and you try to imagine, you know, what the sound of 2,000 parents watching their children being executed is like. Herodotus says, quote, Nine days after Cambyses had taken control over Memphis, he seated Seminitos, king of Egypt, who had reigned six months, and other Egyptians in front of the entrance to the town as an insult, and he tested the spirit of Seminitos in this way. He had the daughter of the former king dressed like a slave, and sent out carrying a jug to get water, along with other girls, selected daughters of the most eminent men, and all dressed in the same way as the daughter of Seminitos. As the girls walked past their fathers, they cried out and wept, and all the other fathers, seeing their children so degraded, answered their cries and wept with their own. But Samanitos, after seeing and recognizing his daughter, only bent down in silence to the ground. Herodotus continues, quote, After the girls had gone by with their water, Cambyses sent out the son of Samanitos, with two thousand other Egyptians the same age, bound with ropes around their necks and bits in their mouths. They were being led in this manner in order to pay the penalty for the Egyptians' destruction of the Mytilenians and their ship. Like investigating the Kennedy assassination, you know, with techniques from the early 1960s or being able to have it happen today and investigate it with DNA evidence and modern-day ballistics and, you know, and audio samples and cameras on every street corner. I mean, the difference is... You know, astonishing. And when modern day historians go back and examine this case, they break it down to the same sorts of things you would if you were Sergeant Joe Friday going into the scene. You'd start looking at the physical evidence, right? The blood spatter and the fingerprints. That's the archaeological stuff. And you start comparing that to the stories you got from the witnesses and the different people around, you know, the neighborhood. They're the, you know, written sources and the stuff that's come down to us. And you start compiling sort of a you know, a composite of what the person, the victim, was like. And then maybe you send investigators down to the city hall and you start looking at the paper trail and see if there's any, you know, records on this person, arrest records, real estate transactions, anything like that. Those are the, you know, ancient sources like the Babylonian tablets that they've found. And you try to compile some sort of a semblance of what happened based on, you know, the total view of the evidence. The story that Cambyses is insane comes from some of the, you know, witnesses at the crime scene. And they may have been giving you the information secondhand, and it may have come from biased sources. But if you're investigating, you know, this crime scene, you'll start with just the facts, as Sergeant Joe Friday might have said. The facts of Cambyses the second reign that you can say with certainty is that he, you know, ruled for about eight years, from about 530 BCE to about 522 BCE. He was the king 
that first really gave the Persian Empire a naval capability. And this may not sound like a big deal, but really it made them the first of the powers that were based in Mesopotamia and that area of the world to have any sort of significant naval capability ever. People like the Assyrians might have had the tribute and the, the nominal allegiance of some of these coastal cities on the Mediterranean, may have even been able to operate some coastal forces or forces in freshwater areas. But the Persians become the first of these people to have a fleet which is significant on the Mediterranean naval world stage, and it should be. They take over the one that was probably the best in the Mediterranean up until that time. They start absorbing Phoenician cities with the fabulous Phoenician navies. And the way the Persians governed, they didn't create their own navy or they didn't take the Phoenicians and, and make them as a base to start their own. They simply went in there and sort of subcontracted it and said, well, listen, what you have to offer the empire, militarily speaking, is, you know, you already have a fleet. So when we need a fleet, your fleet is our fleet and you'll run it and you know what you're doing and there'll be a bonus in it for you if you do well. The Assyrians would have said something like, you perform well or else. The Persians probably said something like, you know, you perform well and there would be a little something extra at the end of the year. So Cambyses is the guy that does that. And that makes a huge difference in the story that's about to happen because if the Persians don't have any naval power, well, a lot of the things that, you know, occur in the rest of their history can't. For example, the other thing Cambyses is absolutely known for, and that's a physical fact, and that's that he's the king of kings that takes over Egypt. Something that requires, by the way, this navy in order to do, and that completes the conquest of his father. Remember, his father, you know, when he first started off conquering things, there were four kind of superpowers in the world at that time, or their version of the world. Cyrus conquered three of them. His son conquered the remaining one. And Egypt was a great state pretty much always. They were no pushover, although not a lot is known about you know, the fighting and the battles and all that sort of stuff. There were some decent stories. One of the more perverse that one of the ancient sources wrote, you know, probably totally false, but said that the Persians took advantage of the ancient Egyptians' reverence for cats and strapped cats to their shields so that the Egyptian archers would be, you know, unsure of how to react to that. That would be exactly the kind of you know, image that a Herodotus-type character would love to share with an audience. That's a colorful anecdote, isn't it? But Herodotus himself says he actually saw bone fields in Egypt from some of these battles, and that would have been, you know, 75 years after the fact or something, so it would be very interesting. It's not like Herodotus to lie about what he actually sees or what he actually talks to somebody about seeing. Herodotus tells a story from the fighting that says that the Persians at one point, and this would be very like them, by the way, because didn't we talk about in the last program that they essentially did this with the Greeks and with other peoples. They sent envoys to the Egyptian defenders at one point, probably trying to offer them a typical Persian deal, you know. Um, you give up this fight, we'll all benefit, blah, blah, blah. It'll be great, you know. Um, and it must have been a sizable delegation because Herodotus says that the Egyptians seized the delegation and tore them limb from limb. And pretty much at any time in history, just about anywhere you go, envoys and, and ambassadors and whatnot are untouchable. I mean, there, there are usually very strong reasons to not abuse the envoys of another country, and the Persians are no example. And as we said in the last episode, the Persians are a very lenient empire, sort of graded on a curve, but they could be just as nasty as their predecessors in the region, you know, when they decided they wanted to send a message. And the Persians were very good at knowing who to send it to. Herodotus tells a story, who knows if it's true or not, about what the Egyptian punishment was when they lost the war and someone had to pay for the treatment of those envoys who were so horribly abused. Herodotus has Cambyses right after he captures Egypt, summoning the Egyptian elite to the capital at Memphis to watch a demonstration of what happens to people who break the law. And I keep trying to imagine what a scene like this is like. It must have been, you know, intense enough with an oral historian like Herodotus talking about it to an audience. I can't imagine what the big screen modern day blockbuster movie would be like. But here's what Herodotus says, and you try to imagine, you know, what the sound of 2,000 parents watching their children being executed 
is like. Herodotus says, quote, Nine days after Cambyses had taken control over Memphis, he seated Seminitos, king of Egypt, who had reigned six months, and other Egyptians in front of the entrance to the town as an insult, and he tested the spirit of Seminitos in this way. He had the daughter of the former king dressed like a slave and sent out carrying a jug to get water, along with other girls, selected daughters of the most eminent men, and all dressed in the same way as the daughter of Seminitos. As the girls walked past their fathers, they cried out and wept, and all the other fathers, seeing their children so degraded, answered their cries and wept with their own. But Seminitos, after seeing and recognizing his daughter, only bent down in silence to the ground. Herodotus continues, quote, After the girls had gone by with their water, Cambyses sent out the son of Seminitos, with two thousand other Egyptians the same age, bound with ropes around their necks and bits in their mouths. They were being led in this manner in order to pay the penalty for the Egyptians' destruction of the Mytilenians and their ship at Memphis, and for the decision of the royal judges was that for each member of the ship's crew, ten eminent Egyptians should be put to death in return. Seminitos saw them passing by and realized that his son was being led to his death. But while the other Egyptians seated around him were crying and openly expressing their anguish, he behaved just as he had in the case of his daughter. End quote. I try to imagine that scene. The parents watching their children put to death. And the slavery thing might not hit home until you think about, you know, these girls were probably dressed extremely scantily. These are formerly the noble women, you know, of the realm. And they're dressed in a way that would be provocative to, let's just say, the male population looking for slaves for more than just menial labor. We tend to forget that element of slavery over time, but it's undoubtable that sex was an integral part of the attraction of having someone that you owned available at any time. And if you're the parent watching your daughter in that situation, the anguish and then to watch your son being executed in front of you and then seeing, you know, the other people in your situation who are right next to you in this crowd, seeing that, I mean, what's that sound like? But is this allegation true? There you begin to ask questions that are part of investigating, you know, the crime scene. I'll tell you this, if it was true, it's not hard to imagine that Cambyses might have made a few enemies in Egyptian society and might not have the greatest reputation in Egypt, which is where you can start the investigative process. Herodotus is very open about where he was getting his information about these events, which happened about 75 years before, you know, he's writing. He says he got information from Persians and Egyptians. Well, the Egyptians might not have been too happy with Cambyses to begin with, and by the time Herodotus is talking to them, they're having problems with Persia, and they're not very happy, and they've had some revolts, and there's every reason to believe that Herodotus' Egyptian sources that he used were particularly anti-Persian and particularly anti-Cambyses. And the Persian sources were too, which is a much harder question to answer. You know, why is the son of Cyrus not more highly thought of amongst his own people? There's a lot of allegations against Cambyses. And we'll use the legal terms, right? Alleged, as though the lawyer is piling up the historical charges against him. He's alleged to have, you know, killed the children of those prominent Egyptians. He's alleged to have lost an entire 40 or 50,000 man army in the desert on the way to conquer an oasis. And supposedly a sandstorm blows up, buries the whole army, and they're still there. Most historians and articles I've read do not believe they're still there, but it's an intriguing enough thing to capture the hearts of archaeologists about every 10 or so years who set out for expeditions or start talking about the, you know, likelihood of finding the lost army of Cambyses. Then supposedly, in his rage and haste, he's supposed to have attacked the people to the south of Egypt— the vile Kush, the Egyptians called them once upon a time, the black African Egyptians, you know, if you will. When people think of, you know, dark sub-Saharan African pharaohs, they're thinking of the Kushites, and the Kushites dominated Egypt for 
you know, the time period, for example, around the Assyrian time period, where you literally had black pharaohs, and the culture of this area down south of Egypt was Egyptian also. You know, and the ancient sources say that Cambyses didn't prepare for this, and his generals told him you know, we had to have supplies, and he didn't care, and the army starts starving in the field. And they draw lots, the ancient sources say, and, and you pick a lot, and the guy who gets the short end of the straw, one out of ten of the Persian soldiers has to sacrifice themselves for the army, and into the pot they go. And then the same sources say that Cambyses, you know, bringing his cannibalistic, decimated army back up to Egypt, gets there and sees the Egyptians celebrating. And so Cambyses assumes that the celebration is a celebration of his misfortune, and he starts getting crazy and killing priests and interrogating them. And then he does the thing that is the most sacrilegious in the tradition, and he picks up a dagger and he stabs the apis bull. If that's true, there's very little that would have upset the Egyptians more than that. The apis bull is a sacred Egyptian symbol. They are venerated, treated with a huge amount of care and respect, and so for Cambyses to deliberately injure or hurt it would have been a huge religious transgression and shocking to the people of Egypt. And once upon a time, the early investigators of this historical crime scene accepted that Cambyses killed the Apis bull, and a lot of other things followed from that. Not hard to see that he's got bad press and is portrayed as insane. Herodotus straight up says he is. And the killing of the Apis bull is one of the best pieces of evidence that proves it. But the modern-day investigators, the Columbos, the Joe Fridays, have more tools at their disposal and more information at hand than the early investigators did. They might have had to rely on, you know, witness testimony back in the day of Will Durant in 1935. But by about the 1960s and 1970s, the records were becoming available, and modern-day historians could look at the equivalent of fingerprints and the blood spatter evidence, and they found out through Egyptian records that that apis bull didn't die because it was killed. Not only did it die a normal death and was interred with the other apis bulls from previous times, but the Persian king of kings, Cambyses, as pharaoh conducted all the normal sorts of religious rites and sacraments you would have expected a native-born pharaoh to do. He behaved exactly as you would have expected him to if he was keeping a continuous policy, you know, of the sort his father used to employ, of tolerance, and having the Persian king assume the legitimate mantle of the religious beliefs and the, the governments of all these countries and fit in perfectly. This is part of what began to make modern-day historians suspicious of the official story. So who was propagating the official story? Is this all based on, you know, Greek writers like Herodotus, who had all sorts of undercurrents of other things he was writing about, including, you know, the idea of the growth of Persian decadence and how, you know, from the greatness of Cyrus, they were already beginning to fall one son into it who's drinking himself to death, spending too much time in the harem and losing his mind, and it's all downhill from there, to themes of Oriental weakness and decadence and indulgence that have continued up until the present day. So you take everything he says with a grain of salt, but there's an influential Persian that sort of takes a swipe at Cambyses and adds fuel to the conspiracy fire when he says Cambyses killed his brother and kept it a secret. Quote, Cambyses had a brother, Bardia by name, of the same mother and the same father as Cambyses. Afterwards, Cambyses killed Bardia. When Cambyses had killed Bardia, it did not become known to the people that Bardia had been killed. End quote. Those ancient allegations are more than 2,500 years old. They were carved into the rock face of a sacred mountainside along which the old heavily traveled royal road used to run. I've always thought of it as kind of one of the most accessible examples of a roadside billboard ad ever, although I don't think it was very easy to see from the road. They put a garden around it and stuff, maybe more like a rest stop, and it contained a carving showing a scene involving human figures, and then in three different languages, a narration. 
The narration is the story of how one of the greatest kings in the Achaemenid Persian Empire, probably number two on most people's top ten list, behind Cyrus the Great, hard to knock the founder of the empire off the top job usually, but this other guy named Darius or Darius the Great. I use both pronunciations interchangeably, and for that I apologize. I'm hopeless sometimes. Nonetheless, this is the story of how he gets the job of King of Kings, as told by Darius the Great himself. It's an autobiography of sorts, but for that reason, it's a little self-serving. This is a guy who, by the way, would seem to have every quality you want in a perspective great king of kings, except for one thing, legitimacy. And this story that he tells on the mountainside, amongst other places, seems to be a quest to explain to you, the reader, you know, why he should have and deserves the top job, including the normal sorts of qualifications that the god wants him to have it, Ahura Mazda being the god, and this is a sort of a change in emphasis in religion for the Persian Empire, much too complicated for me to understand, but fascinating. Says Ahura Mazda, you know, is behind him and gives him all these great gifts and makes him the king and, and wants him to have the job. Goes into his lineage and all the blue blood that's in his veins. These are standard justifications anyone would expect. But then his story veers into the weird the weird and wonderful and conspiratorial and fantastic. I mean, what's funny about this is this is the official story, and the official story is twisted. Darius the Great is an interesting person to get this information from because Darius the Great in our historical crime scene is like Colonel Mustard in the game of Clue. He's a potential suspect because somehow... This guy, who is not directly connected to the royal line, will end up in the top job. How does that happen? Well, it's an interesting story, and Darius the Great carves it alongside a mountain to explain it to you. And it starts off with Cambyses killing his brother and keeping it a secret. And the reason this is important is because apparently Cambyses had no heirs. So what happens if the son of Cyrus, the king of kings, were to die? Who's the only other person, logically, that you give that job to? Well, the other son of Cyrus, right? Bardia, the son who got the consolation prize of empire. You've heard the line, Cyrus's sons were the heir, Cambyses, and the spare, Bardia. If something happens to Cambyses, you turn to the spare, don't you? So how does Darius have the job? Why didn't the spare get the job? Well, funny you should ask. Cambyses killed the spare, and then he didn't tell anybody about it. And then he led the army to conquer Egypt, and Darius the Great serving as his lance-bearer or spear-bearer, which is a, an official position. Think of like a person on the general staff or something. I think he was like 28 years old, part of that increasingly nasty veteran Persian army that conquers Egypt. And according to Darius, while they're away, or while they're on their way home, one or the other, they get the word that the throne has been seized by a usurper. A usurper claiming to be Bardia. But according to Darius, Bardia was dead. The problem, of course, is by not telling anyone, as he says Cambyses didn't, the people didn't know that Bardia wasn't alive anymore. Darius says that the name of the imposter on the throne was Galmata, or Galmata, and he identifies him as a magus, one of the magi. Our modern word magician is related to that. And I didn't realize this until Tom Holland, the historian, pointed it out in his book Persian Fire, but there may be a connection to the fact that this is a really sort of hard-to-believe story, but now it has someone who could be considered to have potential supernatural powers involved, which explains away all kinds of story holes, doesn't it? When you have a problem, you just say, listen, the guy's a magus. You don't know what those people can do. Oh, yeah, that explains it. But after this, Galmata seizes the throne, the empire starts to come over to him. Darius admits on his rock carving that the people began to go over to this false Bardia. 
Bardia seemed to be popular, by the way, too. I compare it to the line that's well-known among football fans, that the backup quarterback is the most popular player on the team. Because, you know, you can invest all your hopes in that. You don't know how that person would play. But you know you're not so happy with the starting quarterback. Cambyses is the starting quarterback. And there were a lot of and historians thinking that there were policies that Cambyses was a part of, for example, you know, cutting down the amount of money to the Egyptian priesthood, you know, eliminating or reducing the power of clan leaders and local nobles so that they could consolidate it in the central government, all these sorts of things, tax policy. He may not have been too popular with a lot of people, whereas this Bardia guy, well, you know, he's the backup quarterback. I think he'd play better if you just gave him the job. So Darius says he was getting a lot of support. It was becoming a big problem. And he's with Cambyses at the time. Herodotus tells this wonderful story, again, another movie scene, where he has the representative from the new king showing up, you know, in front of the army and Cambyses while they're out in the field and proclaiming in front of the army that there's a new king on the throne and that they should no longer, you know, heed the orders of the very king who's with them, you know, visible. Those are great stories. And then somehow in this story in 522 BCE, Cambyses dies. And a bunch of historians will say, you know, suspiciously, it's suspicious that we don't know what happened to Cambyses. According to Darius on his rock carving, he says he died his own death. For a while, that was also translated as by his own hand, which made us all think of suicide a while back, but... More modern historians have pointed out that that's probably not the right translation, and that even if you use the way the Greek writers say he died, you could interpret that as by his own hand and not have it be a suicide question. For example, Herodotus says Cambyses will die after he jumps on his horse and stabs himself with his sword because the tip of the scabbard had come off, and that the leg wound will get infected, and he will die several days later. And by the way, because Herodotus has to tie this story up in a wonderful bow, he says he stabs himself right at the spot on his thigh where he stabbed the apis bull in Egypt. See, once again, karma. Herodotus is a big karma guy. A lot of the ancient writers are. They just don't call it that. But you get your just desserts, right? In another Greek author's tale, which is, you know, strangely similar in its own way, he says Cambyses was whittling a piece of wood with his sword, and he slipped and he cut himself on the thigh, and same thing, infected, dies a few days later. So he died by his own hand, but that's not suicidal. Nonetheless, no one knows how he died, and there's a decent number, maybe I'd say 20% of the historians you read, you know, think that the guy probably was a victim of assassination by his underlings, one of whom was Darius the Great, and suspiciously the one who becomes the next, you know, big king. If you're at the historical crime scene, this Darius the Great guy is the one who's going to get all the stuff of the murder victim. He's Colonel Mustard. He's a potential suspect here. And so his whole story has to be taken with a grain of salt because of what happens next. According to Darius, after Cambyses dies, he organizes what maybe you could call a hit team or an assassination squad, an oligarchic hit team. And he will set out to kill this person who is impersonating the dead brother of Cambyses, right? Because if you believe Darius's official story, when he and his six assassination cohorts go out to do this deed, both of the sons of Cyrus are dead. Now, the story as told by Darius on the mountainside at Behistun or Bizatun, that's what the inscription's called, is in its own way dramatic enough, although it's pretty bare bones. Once Herodotus, the screenwriter slash historian, gets his hands on it, it becomes this wonderful tale, fully modern and probably the precursor to several repetitive movie themes we've all seen a hundred times. But if that's the case, Herodotus is the guy who started this. In his hands, this assassination move is like a Force 10 from Navarone type movie. You know, where you have the assassins or the commandos, but they're working for the good guys. And they'll, you know, go to this heavily armed, you know, Nazi island to take out the head of the Gestapo or something through all these guards with lots of explosions and all these things. That's a little like what the story sounds like. Herodotus says that Darius and his compatriots 
go to a fortress where the false king, the Magus, is staying, and that they get past the guards because of their lofty status in the regime, right? These are the pillars of the regime, the aristocracy. This is the oligarchy walking in. Surely they're nothing to stop at the gates in fear. That's the way Herodotus portrays the story. So the Force 10 from Navarone group get past the first level of defense. Then Herodotus has them encountering royal eunuchs in the courtyard, these royal messengers, he says. The Persians, like a lot of the regimes in that era, had a lot of eunuchs, and there's a lot of debate over whether or not they were sort of really castrated males taken as, as young boys to provide a governmental class for the Persians, or whether castration had actually sort of become symbolic by that point, and it was more of a uh, a, a, a title. It's hard to know. Probably the former, though. I tend to believe the weirdness when I can. And these eunuchs recognize that these seven aristocratic nobles are there for no good and challenge them. And then a knife fight in shoes, making a lot of noise in the courtyard. And again, when you're reading Herodotus at a moment like this, try to remember that a lot of historians think he was performing this live for an audience. And if that's the case, this is a Herodotan action scene. And so all that's missing really are the explosions and the Lucas sound and the big score and the popcorn. And you can hear the courtyard sound effects as there's a lot of noise. And Herodotus basically says that the Magi, and he's got two of them, because why only have one supervillain in a story when you can double up? So instead of just having the Joker in this movie, he's got, you know, the Riddler too, two of the Magi. And they look down in the courtyard, they can hear the commotion, so they arm themselves and then after the Force 10 from Navarone commandos get rid of the eunuchs, you know, they're running towards the stairs, and you can hear, just imagine the music, right? I mean, this is a scene we've all seen, right? They run up there, and there's a swashbuckling fight with the two Magi and the Force 10 from Navarone commando guys. One guy gets stabbed, people are wrestling. And then again, in a scene we've seen a million times, the one principal Magus, the one who is the false Bardia, the one who's been sitting on the throne dressed as the king, takes off and breaks up out of the room to be followed by a guy named Gabrius and the soon-to-be-down-the-road king of kings, Darius. They take off, you know, after the one guy, down the hallway, through the door, into the darkened room. I mean, imagine the music and the tension. Go for your popcorn here, right? And then Gabrius and the false king are wrestling in the dark room, and Darius is sitting there with his sword, but he's afraid to stab because he's afraid of hitting his friend. And Gabrius says to him, Herodotus says, says, why are you hesitating? He goes, I don't want to hit you. And he says, stab us both. Are you crazy? So he runs him through, but only gets the bad guy. Darius in his rock carving is a little bit more bare bones than Herodotus is about what happened. After pointing out that the... You know, fake king had led a reign of terror in Persia because he was wiping out anyone that could recognize that he was a faker. You know, anyone who knew what the real Bardia looked like, he was getting rid of so he could consolidate his position and not be called out a fraud. So after explaining that the reign of terror was going on, Darius says on his mountainside, quote, No one dared say anything about Gaumata the Magus until I came. Afterwards, I prayed to Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda brought me aid. In the month of Bagayadish, ten days had passed, and then I, with a few men, slew Gaumata the Magus and the men who were his foremost followers. A fortress, Sikayavatish by name, and a district, Nasia by name, in Medea, there I slew him. I took the kingship from him. By the favor of Ahura Mazda, I became king." Ahura Mazda bestowed the kingship upon me, end quote. As several historians have said, in this entire account, it does look a little bit like Darius doth protest too much, doesn't it? The story of how he goes from simply being one of the assassins to the one that actually gets the top job involves a horse, and it's not very uh, uh, good to talk about at breakfast, and it's, just, it's a weird story, and it makes no sense at all, and there's no way anybody ever got picked to be a king that way. So it all becomes a little bit weird how Darius ends up at the throne, and no wonder he feels a need to explain it. Here's the problem he faces. If you don't believe that Cambyses killed his brother, look at how this entire story changes. If you're the crime scene investigator and you approach it from that way, well, as historian Pierre Briand says, the entire structure collapses like a house of cards. Because if Cambyses didn't kill his brother Bardia, what happened to Bardia? 
Hmm. And this is where we get back to the game of Clue, where you're examining possibilities, scenarios, motives, things like that. I mean, for example, scenario number one is that maybe Bardia led a rebellion, the very thing that Cyrus the Great was so worried about when he divided his empire and worried so much about giving Bardia the consolation prize to empire and avoiding that terrible thing that happened so often in the ancient world. Well, maybe it happened anyway. There are hints that the brothers may not have gotten along so well. Bardia seemed to be very popular, had that you know, backup quarterback thing going for him. Maybe he led a rebellion, in which case, if Cambyses did kill him, that wouldn't have been some slam on his historical reputation. It would have been a pretty standard thing for a ruler to do and probably justifiable. I think by leaving out the specifics of Cambyses' motive, Darius sort of slanders him for all eternity by letting your imagination or Herodotus's imagination fill in the blanks. Why did Cambyses kill his brother? Because he's insane. You know what I mean? Nonetheless, the idea that Bardia may have led a rebellion with local elites and people trying to preserve their power or pushing a, a different approach for the empire, all of that's very possible, in which case Bardia may have died as a usurper, you know, killed by Cambyses. Another possibility has to do with, you know, a question of timing when this Bardia character took the throne, right? If he took the throne when Darius says he took the throne, when Cambyses is still alive and well, well, then that's a usurpation, right? He's a rebel, basically. But what if he takes it after Cambyses had died? And who knows how that happened, but let's just say we're whittling wood, we cut ourselves, we die ten days later from gangrene. Who does the empire go to? Well, if Cambyses really had no heirs, the way the ancient authors said, the empire should go to Bardia, shouldn't it? And things get really strange when you start asking the question about, you know, if this was the real Bardia, because if Bardia wasn't killed by Cambyses, who is it that Darius and his hit team take out when they go, you know, and kill the Magus, you know, the false Bardia, Galmata? Well, if it's not the false Bardia, it's the real Bardia. When I think of the various scenarios out there, I think of our historical crime scene investigator, you know, showing back up at headquarters and telling their superior officer, you know, the old gray-haired, cynical uh, veteran lieutenant, the official story that they got from the crime scene that this Darius character tells them, yes, I stabbed this guy dressed as the king who had a name tag on that said, I am Bardia, the son of Cyrus, but he wasn't Bardia, and I saved the nation by killing this imposter. And the lieutenant, the grizzled veteran, looking at them like they're out of their mind and going, you don't really believe that crap, do you? Let me tell you what probably happened. This Darius guy killed Cambyses, his king, and then went and killed his brother, the guy who should have been the next king, and then took the throne for himself. Case closed. Well, that might have happened, too. Historians just can't know, though. There's not enough information. It would tell you so much about what was going on to know the facts. But it's like the ultimate cold case file of all time, isn't it? I like the way historian Mark Vandemeroop kind of sums up the situation and gives you the, the sense that, that it's suspicious, but we don't know what happened, and there's a lot of possibilities. He writes, quote, our main source of information about events is the description by the final victor, Darius, who was not a legitimate successor to the throne. His account was carved in three languages on a rock facade at Bayastun in a Zagros mountain valley connecting Babylonia and Iran. It was also spread throughout the empire in Aramaic translation on papyri, and possibly Herodotus used one of these as the basis for the story he told in his histories. We have thus a severely biased description by a usurper who justifies his actions in the text, and it is not easy to determine what really 